Kwanza presents SCP. The Steve Dangle Podcast with your hosts, Steve Dangle and Adam Wild. Ladies and gentlemen, long overdue. A guy that we've wanted to have on actually for a long time. We've been talking about it and talking about it and talking about it. Mr. Ian Tullock. Congratulations, Ian. For Thank making you. it in. You made it past security. You made it through. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tough security. The door almost ate you on the way in. I was going to say, I walked right through with you, and they told me <laughs> I had to wait my turn and walk in on my own. So. The Roger security is a little nuts, and that's why I said congratulations, because you made it through the doors. You've made it. You've graduated in life, I think. This is all just an elaborate plot to shove you in a trunk. We want to be the only Leafs <laughs> podcast out there, and we, we, just, we can't have any competition. And I'm sorry. You seem like a really friendly guy, but, you know, it's what, here it is, forever. It's what it is. Um, the Leafs keep. Geeks, by the way, the Leafs geeks. I'm looking into cameras that don't exist. Uh, Jesse, you wanted to, to bring something up. Emily Kaplan tweeted something. Yeah, Ian, and you should feel honored. Uh-oh. Um, you're on the show the day we discovered the most hockey thing to ever exist. Oh, Maybe I the most. I, I think it's I know this. Cody Franson tweet by me. It is <laughs> not. Oh, my God. Uh, Brown, Bracco, in a second. <laughs> the, Her- the Carolina Hurricanes oh, announced their training camp schedule. And it includes from 8.45 to 10.45, Team Grit practice. <laughs> and then at 10.45, Team Grind practice. Oh, that's good. So, And you know they're look, in the best shape of their lives right now. Look you out know. for the Hurricanes. The team of guys in the best shape of their lives. What a surprise. They're coming for you. I First honestly, we grit, <laughs> then we grind. They're very clearly. Carolina Hurricanes, am I right? High five. I, I'm wondering what happened there because they totally just... Just just drove the bus over Jeff Skinner's corpse several times yeah. before trading him for pennies on the dollar. And then uh, they've got graphic. this and then they have this whole cultural reset thing that they seem to be going through without actually saying it. And I say cultural reset because that's what the Raptors had to do last year. I wonder what the hell went on in Carolina last year. Like what happened? It, it's weird. Yeah, th- this to me is just one more thing to pick on with the Hurricanes. Like it's probably, let's be honest, it's September 5th. Team grit and team grind. It's probably just them doing workouts with like a skating coach or a strength coach. I mean, what what are they doing? Running into a chain link fence? Couldn't they just say just, team one or team two? Uh, just taking a cheese grater to their to their knuckles, <laughs> and they're gonna need a new cheese grater because yeah. it's gonna it's gonna have dents in it. It's gonna so, break. So many calluses. This, they have many grit charts in their hand. No, it's just. I don't know. It's just another thing to pick on with them. What's much more concerning to me is I was having this conversation with someone the other day. Who the hell plays for the Carolina Hurricanes? Well, I don't remember. Sebastian Ajo. They yeah. got like the six, probably the, yeah. the best core of six defensemen together on one team. They got some players. Last year, their shot metrics are good. And you asked what was wrong with them last year. They had an 893 save percentage on the season. <laughs> that might have something to do with their. Uh, so do you think they overreacted? Thank you, Ian, for that very literal answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for, they've made a lot of moves. <laughs> Right. They do have a good decor. <laughs> Instead of regressing, it should be literally in. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, but I, for the longest time, I thought that was regress land. That's how dumb I am. I well, I should probably change it because I changed it from Leaf Geeks podcast to Regress Ian. I wanted something like a dad joke, something to be funny, but it's really not that funny. So I, I should probably change it. I think you should. I, I think it. you should leave it now. Now it's a brand. I think yeah. it should be your name. Yeah, just change my name from Ian Tullock to Regress Ian Tullock. Regress Ian, no, I yeah. think your Twitter handle should be your name. Oh, yeah, no, it's taken. Oh, no, no, Ian, Ian. Ian Tullock's taken, and like Ian oh, T really? is oh. taken. A lot of things I wanted were taken, so I'm like, ask you know, you know, Steve. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Steve. Ian Lur. Steve Dangle is actually taken by someone who's not him, and that person has tweeted once, and Twitter has never shut down their account, and so it has to be Steve underscore Dangle. So that was someone working for the agency... Um, that Nike hired for the oh. Olympics. So they reserved it for me, but I'm like, I, what? I already have a Twitter, so now I just don't get to use it. <laughs> and they didn't feel the need to tell me. You never, they told me like two months but later. But you never like asked them, hey, can I have the login so I can change yeah. that? Yeah, well, I already had a bunch of followers on my Steve yeah, underscore. Yeah, but you, you could have changed, changed the, the name. Yeah, yeah. Oh, can you, I? Can I change, you can edit your name even now, but you'll lose your blue check marks. You have to tell Twitter that you're doing it. Oh, we have branding no, and we, stuff. I don't care. <laughs> I'll be one of the old school. We have branding and stuff. People. Steve underscore Dangle. I don't yeah. think we do. Yeah, on the podcast. Oh, we're going to yeah. change that oh, anyway. We are. Oh. It's time for a new intro. Um, also, anyway, your Instagram isn't the same as your Twitter, which throws everything off as well. Mm-hmm. You know. Okay. Also, there are people at Sportsnet who oh. work directly with Twitter that I'll change this for you. Okay. Yeah, just like put in a phone call. I'm man. just saying. 
There are options. Oh, oh, anyway, right. Ian, regress Ian is something you is should hang on to. Is this an intervention? Because <laughs> you, need, this? you need to you need to hang on to this because now we know you as that. Now now you're that guy, and and it's like it's like uh, down goes Brown. Just by the way, congratulations to him. Just hired at the athletic today. Absolutely, along with everyone else. On yeah, the planet. <laughs> literally, Jason Botchford was like, whoa, that was that, a good hire. That I was like a that one. huge one. Um, but third, like third down goes Brown. Suits. His real name is Sean McIndoe. Uh, no one knows his, knows him as Sean McIndoe. He's down goes Brown. Like published author under Sean McIndoe, and it's like mm, AKA down goes. Brown. Yeah, I've been calling him McKindo all this time. So clearly, oh, I don't know. How to, I, oh, I have be. no idea. No, clearly, you, I don't know how to pronounce else. it. There a you lot go. Of people do that. So. Maybe I'm the one who's yeah, wrong. We could be but wrong. He's been down goes Brown all, all the time. I've known him. Yeah, so. totally. <laughs> Third period suits uh, was tweeting like, "Who doesn't work for the Athletic?" And I'm like, <laughs> "Just me, um, Hi, everyone." So. Um, with regard to since we we we, ha, we were talking about Carolina, I just wanted to quickly step step into that again. Do you think they're a good team? Because they seem to be a good team, and they seem to be a good team before last year. And you know, one one thing, I mean, the, the, no goaltending will, will will sink you very quickly. But it seems like they've overreacted to a problem that they maybe didn't need to. And through the new Columbus Blue Jackets, where we go, it's their year. Oh, it's not their year. And then when they're finally overripe, they work out. Well, it's funny. I love the Dougie Hamilton trade for them because, I mean, now oh. when you look at their defense core, it's who you got. You got Slavin on the left side. You've got... Who else you got there? They just signed uh, De- Calvin DeHaan. Yeah, they've got Hayden was... Fleury also there on the left side, top 10 pick. And on the right side, you've got Dougie Hamilton, Brett Pesci, and Justin Falk on your third pairing. It's yeah. just absurd. And don't they have don't they have someone coming up too? I want to say Jake Bean. Jake Bean's still in their system. He's a really good defenseman. So, I mean... They've also got the lowest cap space, like lowest spend in the league. They're at $16 million. They've got $18 million in cap space. Still. Going, still. Like right now. They've never spent a lot of money. I know when uh, Ron Francis was there, they barely spent like $60 million and he still had that team performing well at five on five, performing well on the penalty kill. They can't score, man. They Their shooting percentage has always been historically low. Their save percentage has been historically low. They're one of those teams where like the shot metrics are really good, like top five in the league and Corsi, expected goals, name your stat. Like they're getting pucks on net and pucks from good locations. The question's always been, are they not creating enough pre-shot movement? Is there maybe something systemically that leads to them having a lower shooting percentage or is it just talent mm-hmm. when you get guys like Evgeny Svechnikov in the lineup when you get guys like Valentin Zaikov when you get some better shooters in there maybe they'll have a higher shooting percentage but then you get rid of Jeff Skinner I, I'm not a big fan of that one I wouldn't have made that if <laughs> like, I were them but yeah. uh, that's he, what I, I look at this lineup and I go Stahl, Williams, Rast, Teravainen, Martinuk, Furlan, Aho, Svechnikov who you mentioned, McGinn, uh, Di Giuseppe uh, who's got to be one of Steve's relatives, <laughs> Zaikov uh, no I'm, I, I'm looking through this, and I'm going to go, who's going to score? You're going to have Sebastian Ajo scoring for sure. I, I love Sebastian Akov has a crazy season. I, yeah. I don't think people realize how good Sebastian Ajo is. He's, no, I don't think they do either. For my money, he's, right. he's like William Nylander. He's just an excellent player. He can be a first-line center for my money. Yeah, Absolutely. I was talk, talking to someone uh, about that yesterday. I think maybe part of what sank them last year was he couldn't score for like a month and a half. And then my wife dropped him in her hockey pool, and that was a bad idea. And he started scoring. Yeah, and he started scoring. And then you've got. I mean, I, I feel like they overcommitted to Scott Darling before they needed to, but um, but you know, having him in at least Peter Morazic, who for some reason seemed he's only twenty six. Did you guys realize that? He's only 26 years old. I, 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 he's, he feels like he's been around the league forever. It's weird. Sometimes it feels like he's been around forever, and other times I'm like, man, there's no way he's that old. Because I still remember him as the quirky goalie for the the checks at the world juniors who like came out of his net to go yeah and celebrate with the team and stuff so yeah. he's somewhere between I don't know 18 and 36 does does Scott Darling regress to the mean as in is there enough sample size to suggest that last year was a was a bad season for him? I mean, he's never really played more than, what is it, 30 games? Yeah, I'd love to give you a good answer when it comes to goaltending, especially goaltending in Carolina. That's kind of where the voodoo-ness gets even more yeah, voodoo-ish because you get good goalies. Like Eddie Lack, for example, performed really well in Vancouver, albeit in a small sample, went to Carolina and completely imploded. With Scott, Dar- Scott Darling, so far we've seen the same thing. Is it going to happen again next year? I, I don't know what to tell you, but it's really weird. Uh, it's it's just wonky. I can't explain it. A lot of things when it comes to goaltenders, I just can't explain. Like, not this past season, but the season before, Corey Schneider had a really bad year. What was up with that? No one really understood it, and then he bounced back, had a good year. So, okay, maybe it's just a one-off. Could that have been a one-off for Scott Darling, or is he actually not that great of a goalie, and there's a big problem systemically in Carolina that results in their goaltenders giving up, a, a, you know, having a low save percentage. So... 
I, again, I don't know what to tell you, but I, I bet you that guys like Dom Lucision and company are, are betting on Carolina to make the playoffs this year because, like, damn it, this is going to be the year. It wasn't last year. It wasn't the year before. Something's got to give eventually. I think what you'll see with, with uh, the forwards up front in Carolina – you named uh, Svechnikov. I think they have a couple players on their uh, AHL team that are going to make a difference this year. We're close with Toronto. So we know all about Cap- Kasperi Kapanen, Andreas Janssen, Travis Dermott. They've got a couple guys there. They've got Lucas Walmark, who is one of the highest uh, scorers in the AHL. He's really good. Valentin Zaikov, when he was in the NHL last year, if you look at a metric like, let's say, uh, expected goals individually, he was generating so many scoring chances from in tight in his limited sample towards the end of the season. I think he could be a big time goal scorer. I think he could pot at least 20. I think Lucas Walmart can make the NHL maybe be a 15, 20 goal scorer. You're not going to replace that 30 goal scorer that you got in, in Jeff Skinner, but you do have Svechnikov coming to the lineup. So mm-hmm. I know this isn't a Carolina podcast. I no, just, but I just thought, because <laughs> they are truly no. like, cause really, cause who cares? We, we just go wherever we go, but I find them to be one of the most fascinating teams in the NHL, especially with that new owner coming in and being like Mr. Hockey all of a sudden. And it was so strange. And, like it's just such a great opportunity for a fresh approach. And he comes in, he's like, actually, we're going backwards. And yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. Reminds me of Jerry Jones, just like micromanaging everything like he yeah. does with the Cowboys. And and, and you were gonna sign a GM for four hundred grand. Nope, you're not. I mean that was the that was the thing. That's why they couldn't get a, a Mike Fuda out of LA. And that's just that, that to me that kind of speaks to the fact that like you know, they they come in and obviously these guys are super talented. You, you don't get to that that level usually, especially if you're if you're first generation wealth like that, uh, without being brilliant at something. But that doesn't mean you're brilliant at everything. And uh, that's that's always kind of my thing. When you manage, you can manage the business side of the hockey operations and sales and and marketing and all of that. But when it comes to um, play, I, I find I find that people think that they can just pick it up. And I don't think that that's possible. Like I think it takes years. So so let me let me ask this then to Ian. So you like the Hamilton trade? Was that a smart good trade or was that a lucky good trade? I mean, <laughs> it's difficult to say. We have a track record of what two trades with this GM. One looks yeah. good, one does not look good. So right, uh, it's yeah. uh, it's tough to say. What I will say about the Jeff Skinner trade, which I find a bit interesting. I wouldn't have traded Jeff Skinner. I don't think that's a good idea. But usually what you'll see when people trade a player of his caliber is they trade him for like a first round pick and like a B-level prospect. What they did with him, they got, let me double check on the trade, but they got multiple pieces if I remember correctly. I think it was they got, four picks. They got a second round pick, a third round pick, a sixth round pick, and Cliff Pooh, yes. if I remember correctly. Yes. Ah, you're right. You're right. It wasn't I think picks. that's the right approach. If you're trading a star player is to go for the, you know, the machine gun approach and get multiple picks as opposed to trying to get that upper end pick. Because I think what we found in the draft but through a lot of research now is that after about pick 20, pick 25, the picks are very similar. Like most people don't realize how close a late first round pick and a third or a fourth round pick are. They're not that different when it comes to finding a, a star talent or even a, an NHL talent. So if you're going to trade a star player, why not get a second, a third and a sixth and a prospect that you like in Cliff Poo? I like it from that respect. I wouldn't have traded Jeff Skinner because I think he's a core piece that you lock up and you resign. But if you're going to trade a player like that, I kind of like the idea of getting multiple picks and you know multiple prospects if you Instead can. Instead of because I feel like if there's a one in there, if there's a first rounder in there, people kind of shut up. And they yeah. go, oh, no, that's a decent return. But but if it's pick 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, who cares? Because that was, well, that was one of the things I think I was more critical about when we talked about it was just, like, what is this? Um, but, well, and, and, and a couple if, of the picks happen two right. years from now, right? They're not, they're not next draft, they're the draft I after. I think so. And also, Skinner said no to a few trades. And if you're looking for a first round pick after the Duchesne trade, I think you're losing teams who have an appetite for that. You're not going to get an unprotected first rounder out of the Buffalo Sabres. What, what if they're in the lottery and they give you they're not giving you the first overall pick for Jeff Skinner. Right. You know and, what I mean? And so what, you know what I was like I was going to wait till later in the show cuz we were supposed to hit the uh, the leaves first, but I actually kind of I'm I'm interested to hear how you would take you would handle this. So if you say trade Nylander, I'm walking out that no. door. <laughs> no, we're not talking about the leaves. I, I actually want to go to the sense. Uh, the Leafs. We'll, we'll they talk. Sign Cody Friends. We'll talk about the Leafs. Yes. But, I really um, thought you were going to say Cody CC, and I was really worried. <laughs> if um, CC for Nylander, who says no? If you're the general manager of the Ottawa Senators, you personally, first three things you do. Oh man, <laughs> where do you take them right now? Today you take over for Dorian. Is Eugene Melnick still the owner? Uh, I think that's the I most important say, question. First thing I do, quit. Let's just <laughs> go to the bar. Third thing, wake up somewhere. Let's say there's no ownership issue. 
just from a purely hockey perspective. I know you can't do that in a vacuum, but let's just do it for this this exercise. If the Ottawa Senators need to make correct decisions, what are the correct decisions? You got to trade Carlson, or you assume that you do, right? If yeah. he wants out. Let's assume Carlson wants out. I think with the Melnick situation, you have to assume that. And what went down with, with Mike Hoffman, it's just such a bizarre scenario in Ottawa right now. It's no. I, no one really understands it. But I guess if you accept the fact that Carlson needs to go, you should probably trade him now as opposed to waiting until the deadline, right? Because you're, his value is just going to go down from now on. And what you're looking to get in return from him, I've heard that Vegas was involved, and I know that the pieces that you could grab from them, maybe you could grab some mid-round picks, you know, second, third, fifth round pick. Get one of their high-end prospects. Maybe see if you can get like an Eric Brandstrom on defense, who I'm in love with. Swedish defenseman can really move the puck. Um, I'm sure that they were trying to get Cody Glass, and I know that we saw that Vegas was not willing to give him up, and everyone was making fun of Vegas, but... I think that when you see what Carlson goes for, I think it's going to be less than a, than a prospect of that caliber. So, then, so. If, you, if you're structuring that deal and you're trying to make it the most advantageous, advantageous for Ottawa in the, sen- in, in the same way that Carolina structured the, the Skinner deal, would you go for, you know, like if Ve- let's assume Vegas is good again this year because we still don't fully know. Right? We're not really sure. Well, they're down their number one defenseman. We just looked. Yeah, <laughs> that sucks. Uh, but, you know, if, if, if they are a playoff team, then you're looking at a pick past that number 20 mark that you mentioned. So are you going for one first round pick or are you going for two seconds and a third or three, th- three thirds and a second? Or what, like, what are you looking for? One of my favorite trades that was made like last year was the, uh, it's funny is the Matt Duchesne trade, which we're talking about <laughs> later on, but look at what Colorado got in return for Matt Duchesne. They got a bunch of young prospects, a bunch of picks, they got who did they get in that trade? I'm trying uh, to remember was, back um, now. Was Samuel pieces, Girard. Sam Girard was my favorite was piece in the one. trade, and he's like already a top four defenseman. He's fantastic at moving the puck. Adam's it, on it. Uh, the right. Sens first rounder <laughs> for 2019. <laughs> a top five pick in 2019. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. If yeah. you get one so, of those, that'd be great. Ottawa got a first. They got the uh, they uh, they got the sorry. Colorado got a first from Ottawa. The Ottawa third. Shane Bowers, Andrew Hammond, who ended up somehow back in Ottawa. Did he not? Uh, yeah, on loan. Um, Nashville's second pick somehow. Jesus. Samuel Gerard and, oh, Vladislav Kamenev, too. So that was for mm-hmm. Matt Duchesne. That was for a year and a half of Matt Duchesne, essentially, right? Yeah, and Nashville got Kyle Turris. So Whoa. is a year of Eric Carlson worth more than a year and a half of Matt Duchesne? I would assume it should be, mm-hmm. logically. So I'd be looking for that plus. I'd be looking for the return you got on Matt Duchesne plus. And who's going to give you that? You, that's, that's, that's where you orchestrate a three-team deal, maybe. I'm not sure what you do to get creative about it, but I feel like there's a way to get those pieces back if you really want to. I think, uh, oh God, who are the players involved? I, I I bit on the Carlson to Vancouver stuff because I was like, <laughs> all right, let's, let's see if it could make some sense. I don't really think it does, but what... What could Vancouver possibly give up? Why to, are they interested in, in it, Carlson's a rental at this point? Yeah, basically, I don't think they should be. And but, yeah, well, and that's another thing, though. I think unless you're one of maybe four teams in the league, you don't do a Carlson trade unless you were guaranteed to get him extended. If you're Tampa, let it let it ride, man. You you might win a cup here, um, but w- with the Canucks, I came up with a package where I didn't give up. Any other big guys, and I didn't hear much pushback from Ottawa because a lot of them were like, "I, I think this is, I think this is kind of." So who of did you have in that trade? Get. Did you have I'm like Cole Lind exactly. and company? Did you have like uh, Jet uh, Jet Wu, um, Adam Goddard, Cole Lind, like those guys? No, because uh, I know they're big ones. Are Pedersen, Quinn Hughes, Jonathan Besser? Dolan. You're not touching those guys. I liked Dolan. I really yeah, liked Dolan. I had him going. Um, Again, this just seems crazy. Like, why would Vancouver trade? A few yeah, guys. really. I, I don't. I <laughs> think that, but, they, but it wasn't any of their big guys because, again, it's it's Ottawa. If you if you're a GM in the NHL. You just smack them around like they they got no leverage. Yeah, they got time nothing. for a bit of game theory, right? right. <laughs> like the, their backs a, are against the wall. I have like, a bit of a theory about that Canucks thing too, because I feel like Jesse's amazing. Oh. So two Ottawa: Sven Berchi, Jonathan Dolan, uh, Oli Ulevi. Oh, I like him. <laughs> and a 2019 second. But again, I don't I don't understand why Vancouver wants one year of Eric Carlson. I, maybe they've convinced themselves that those fourth line centers that they signed in the off season are going to lead them to the promised land. But I. I I could I could talk for multiple hours about Vancouver and what's what's wrong there. Oh, but. we'll get to them. <laughs> but if I I think I have this theory that they that only made it into the press because they'd had some pretty bad looks recently, especially with the Trevor Linden stuff. So it gives 
people like us something else to talk about. Bit of a distraction. Yeah, because yeah. really, truly, and we'll, again, we can get into this later, there's no way that makes sense for them. There's no way. Unless, oh, getting Carlson? Unless no. they are crazy enough to think that they're good. But again, they you might be. You should only be trading for Carlson if you're a contender at this point. Right. Otherwise, it doesn't make much sense Ex- for you. Exactly. And I think that the problem is that everybody thinks that first round pick that they're going to get is going to be a top 20 pick, and it's not. Th- this is it's just not. Vegas keeps coming up is the idea that Carlson is tied to Bobby Ryan. I go, okay, well, let's look at teams around the league who could afford that to extend Carlson and get Bobby Ryan at the same time. I mean, no team with that much cap space is a contender, except for Vegas. You know what I mean? That's why they keep coming up. Maybe Toronto this year, but you're not looking to trade them to Toronto. That's just not going to happen in a million years. Oh, no, no Toronto wouldn't be able to extend them. No, unless they traded Nylander and company. Yeah, yeah. No. Uh, so there we are. Now, get out uh, of there this There it is. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> get out. <laughs> so we Walk found right out, into that. We found out today... Um, we found out today that that uh, through this uh, this huge Bob McKenzie sit down interview, which honestly was a total coup for TSN. Um, uh, Kyle they, Dubas on next episode, by the way. Dubas for fifty one minutes, and he talked about. No one um, believes me. What? Uh, <laughs> I would imagine. I imagine they try to keep it as even as possible. So maybe with Dubas going on the Jeff Merrick and Elliot Freeman thirty one thoughts podcast, this would have been the uh, the second half of that. Maybe you know because they usually it's like record companies. They try to keep it even. Teams try to keep it even with the media outlets. He's gonna be throwing a lead. Geek's podcast appearance. You never know. Yeah, I mean, hey, <laughs> do, you, do you have something to announce? You want to tell no, us? No, I really wish I did. No, <laughs> yeah, um, he works for the Athletic. Oh, wait. oh, oh there it sorry. is. So yeah. the start is that um, Mitch and Austin no immediate contracts to announce. Nothing, nothing even close. And that's what he. That's what Kyle Dubas said. Uh, and he did say that he acknowledged that William Nylander would would take some time. And we've gone over this. And uh, when I was filling in on the fan, it was like every day we asked someone else, "What do you think that contract's going to look like?" So what do you think that contract's going to look like, and what do you think it should look like? And those are two completely different questions. So I think the most recent comparables you can look at are Ehlers and Pasternak, which you guys have probably talked about in the past. Um, Pasternak signed his contract last season, and it was for that season. He signed the six-year, $6.66 million. That was for 2017-2018. Ehlers signed his extension at roughly the same time, but it doesn't kick in until this year. Right. So you have that argument of... They both look real good. That's what, The Ehlers one especially. Oh. Is because, well, I mean, Pasternak's probably the better player, but Ehlers is coming in at cheaper, but... I mean, point production-wise, Nylander's been very similar to Ehlers throughout his career. Hasn't been quite as good point production-wise as Pasternak. Pasternak did get to play with Berger and Marsha. I've heard that that helps, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure True. if that, that comes into the Still, arbitration Still, you got to keep up with them, right? Yeah, and one they, of the best lines in the damn sport. He, he was no drag on I that line. I love Pasternak. He's a great player. I hate that I love him as yeah, a Leafs fan. It's just frustrating how talented that guy is. But Same. So when you're looking at the cap hit percentage on David Pasternak, if you're William Nylander, that six point six six million under the new cap would be roughly about seven million. If you're looking at the Ealers contract, it kicks in this season. So if I'm Nylander's or if I'm Nylander's agent, I'm saying he's worth the Pasternak contract and that cap hit comes to about seven million this year when you adjust for the inflation. If I'm the Leafs, I'm saying, no, you're worth Nick Ealers' money, and Ealers is making six million dollars this year onwards. That's what you should be making. And I feel like that's where the negotiations are. Somewhere in the middle. Yeah, somewhere in the middle. So So, so you think somewhere in the middle of Ehlers and Pasternak? Um, Well, if Pasternak means seven million under the current cap. Under the current cap. I was about to say, if it starts with a six. You sign that right away. It depends how many years, though. Um, If it's six years, then I'm sure that you can get something in the six range. If you want to go to seven or eight years. It's going to cost more naturally because those are UFA years. So if if you're the Leafs, do you want to sign Nylander to a six year deal and get a pretty nice deal on it? Maybe let's say six and a half million, six point seven. I don't know what he signs for. Or do you want to sign him to an eight year deal for seven, seven and change? Because then you're getting like what two extra it, years. So what is that? That's 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 the question. Those two extra years. If those two extra years cost you, um, say point five, so it's seven and a half over eight years. That's a big deal. This That's is a big I, I, contract. I pulled this out on Twitter, so let me see if I can put it out right now. Because I asked fans if they would prefer Nylander at six years for seven million, mm-hmm. or at eight years for seven and a half million. Or I worded it another way. I'm like, would you prefer him at six years for six and a half million, or eight years for seven million? The overwhelming majority in both votes preferred the longer term deal, even though it costs a little bit more money. So 
But that makes me speculate as well. Maybe I didn't have it weighted properly. Maybe it's a bit more than five hundred thousand for those extra two years. So maybe I it's, would think so. That's what I mean. But so, it's not yeah. five hundred thousand just in those two years. It's five hundred thousand across the across years. the entirety of the deal. Of course, right? Well, yeah, I think you're probably looking at maybe a million. That's what I'm thinking per year. Per year, just because of how expensive those two years are going to cost you. Nylander is going to be in his prime with a well. He's in his prime at age 23, 24 based on the research. But in terms of his actual point totals, that's probably where he's going to be at his apex. Maybe an eighty point player at that point. He's going to make a lot of money with the cap going up then. So a player of Nylander's caliber in the year, what's six years from now, what that's, what's that's going to be 2024, 2025, mm-hmm. what's a star player like Nylander going to be making? Probably a lot more. Yeah, probably maybe eight digits by then, you know, if the yeah. cap really goes up, like we've seen in other sports. So, it well, might- and, and it's, and so, and, and I'm not to cut you off, but that, so th- this is the, the thing right now is that you've got um, a lot of numbers that make a lot of sense for Nylander. We have a, we have a very, like, it's a million dollars the range that we yeah. think it's going to be in, right? Six and a half ish to seven ish, give or take, yeah, depending, depending on, on the, the year, terms. Yeah. Exactly. And Matthews, it seems that the consensus is, and I don't think this is based on anything but just consensus, that a similar deal to what John Tavares got. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, eleven over eight. He's so good that it's kind of easy, right? It's you know always I mean? like, yeah, like here, let's sign this, and then whatever. We're assuming that he doesn't want to make more than that from the Leafs. I don't know what it is, but and, and I don't know. I mean, I know James, James, and Jonas talked about it on uh, on the Leaf Report that they kind of felt like that was the range that they would be in. The question I keep wondering about is. Mitch Marner. And the reason I, I question about Mitch Marner is there's this perception that out there that he is that much better than William Nylander. We need to talk about this. And I, mm. I, I, I have to be honest with you, and this is not slagging Mitch Marner, because I don't think Mitch Marner is a bad hockey player at all. I think he's very, very good. But I don't think he's that much better than William Nylander. I think they're equal in talent. Yes. Yeah, I yeah. think they're is that two fair? different versions of the same sick player. Yeah, and, and I they're think, both sick, right? I, th- I think Marner's <laughs> better on the power play, and I think Nylander's better at five on five. And I'm not sure if that's a hot take. I know a lot of people would watch Marner down the stretch last year and Dude, say that he was phenomenal, who's, but he was also ice cold for the. That. Yeah, he was ice cold at the beginning of the season, right? So, so if you're going to take one, you got to take the other too. I think when you look at some of the nerdier stats, like me, you look at zone exits and zone entries. Nylander's got Marner beat there. Nylander carries the puck from the defensive zone to the offensive zone with possession phenomenally well. He's so good at it. And you watch him play, that makes sense. You know, it matches the eye test. Dude's incredible with the puck. Gets in the offensive zone, creates tons of passes, tons of shot assists, which is something that we know correlates to, to future goals. Nylander's a bit better at that than Marner over the past two seasons at 5-on-5. Five five. Now, on the power play, this year, Marner led one of the best units we've ever seen. So, yeah. I think it's fair to say Marner's a bit better on the power play. As of right now, Nylander last year, not not 2017-2018, but 2016-2017, Nylander was top five in the league in power play points per 60. He's ahead of Marner, ahead of Matthews, ahead of all those guys. So, so he's got it. Yeah, like... It's just, it, have you... Um, so th- these guys have been making fun of me because all summer I've just been watching Leafs highlights. Have you seen the video that is just all of JVR's goals from last year? Just all from the crease. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Right. Like, if you have seen it, I want to know your reaction. Like, did you just laugh? Because that's all I did. Well, I, mean, I did a lot of power play analysis last year because I was obsessed with that Marnie unit and what they did because I thought it was phenomenal. If you look at um, shots per 60, they're the best of like the last 10 years. You look at expected goals per 60, which is basically weighted shots. It weights shots that are closer than that, a bit heavier because you have a higher chance of scoring. Mm-hmm. And it weights shots from the blue line very low because you're not going to score from 60 feet away. The Leafs had the best expected goals per 60 on the power play ever since we started recording it. We started recording Even, it in 2007. Wow. So over the last man. 11 years. It's the best team in the history of the stats. Best, best power play unit. Uh, over since a we, Yeah, over a decade. And wow. that's because Mitch Marner is so good at feathering that puck into the slot for JVR. He's also good at the slap pass to Kadri. Also got to give Riley tons of credit for opening up that space for Marner. And whenever he had a lane to get a shot through, he would whip that wrist shot through for JVR or Kadri to tip. It just worked so well. No disrespect to Bozak, but he was just kind of there. I know he was on the left side of the ice. I felt like that on five, like on five on five too. I felt like he and JVR I mean, were just kind of there. Actually, that's another bone I got. But we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. To that. Uh, but Bozak's always been kind of a, a banging guy, and I guess he's been good at that. And role. he's an extremely underrated passer, I find, which yes. people tend to forget about his game. And he knows to get to the open areas and can finish on empty nets sometimes, depending so, on the day. Are but, you are you one of the people? 
or are we still talking about the power play? We can I, still talk. I was going to quickly get We're back to your, why I love yeah. Marner so much, and then because I want to get back okay. to Balzac actually. And Martin Ma, we need to do Martin Elander right yeah. now. Yeah. Yes, yeah. so yeah, but I must stay there. They were so good on that power play, getting into the zone, getting the puck to Marner, and then just letting him do his thing on the right wall. He would draw defenders into him, then sauce a pass into the slot. All of a sudden, Kadri, JVR, Bozak would all converge for the rebound, created tons of chaos down yeah. low. Best goals per 60 in the NHL, best expected goals per 60, best shots per 60 at 5-on-4, like absurd unit. Realistically, probably should have got more time. I know people are complaining about Matthews not getting That's enough power hilarious. play time. Maybe you should have Matthews there instead of Bozak. That could be an argument. But huh. that Marner unit deserved to be on the ice for more minutes, in my opinion. And that was just a phenomenal unit. So on the power play, Marner's been doing this since he was a kid. You know, you watched him in junior, did the exact same thing on the London Knights, got Christian Dvorak a bunch of goals. Mm-hmm. And Wasn't it 72 or something? I don't like think that? he scored that many, but it was. I, I think you might be thinking of Tavares when he was on Oshawa. Mm-hmm. But I'm trying to Dvorak think. scored a crap ton of goals yeah. when he was on London. But, man, Marner's so good on the power play. Nylander's no slouch in the power play. Over the last two years, if you look at five and four uh, points per 60, Nylander has more points than McDavid and more points than Crosby per 60 minutes. Wow. Those are he just per- gets less time. Gee. Yeah, yeah. You don't realize it because he's not on the ice for as long because Toronto's been splitting the units for the past year. He's also, it's funny, for such a flashy player in this conversation that we're having, he's easily the least flashy player. Like, I, I feel like he, he goes out there and just kind of does his job and he's methodical about it. Marner goes out there and takes souls. Like, he, he, he does things that, <laughs> wow. He embarrasses, play. embarrasses I players. Watched, I watched that play. Oh, God. It was someone, I want to say, on the Sharks. LeBanc? Kevin LeBanc. Yeah, I, th- I LeBanc. think it was Kevin, Kevin LeBanc was yep. following him. Marner was at the offensive blue line and LeBanc chased him back into the leave zone. So that's a no-no on Marner's part. But he did this little like juke where <laughs> LeBanc fell down. <laughs> he took his ankles. He took his ankles just because. He didn't need to. It was a totally needless play. But I, I just feel like, you know, he could go the rest of the play, nothing materializes, and you still go, damn. Marner, but Marner's is, so sick. Is that what you know? leads to this perception? That Mitch Marner is a step above Nylander because it's almost the way the way it's talked about in 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 media circles and with fans is is almost that that Mitch Marner is just a step behind Austin Matthews and while no. I, while I think Austin, yeah while Austin Matthews or, sorry, while Mitch Marner is a great player who you talk to but yeah. yeah I don't think Mitch Marner or Nylander are just a step behind Matthews I think Matthews is, has put himself up in that upper echelon that are a full step ahead of everybody else. Did like, you see what Dom Lucian's p- projections were for him this year? No, no, I didn't. 47 goals based on, <laughs> on his model, based on his projections. And you know a lot of Leaf fans are going, that's it? <laughs> well, per 82 games, I mean, if he stays healthy, that doesn't shock me at all. That's basically what he did last year. He yeah. just didn't play the games. That's right. Yeah, he's now, and, too. and he'll get a lot more time on the on the power play this year, probably. We suspect. Too. We suspect. <laughs> we suspect. So, so I, I guess my, my point in this is that when it comes to contracts, the I, the thought is that Mitch Marner, I mean, we had, the, when we filled in, the number that was thrown at us and we talked to Chris Johnson about was $10 million. Someone threw it $10 million, and I think it was Darren Dreger. I'd love to see yeah. the comps for that. Well, and it, it, exactly, yeah. and it was it was probably an agent going to Darren, hey, this is what we're going to go in at. Well, of course, you can go in at, I could go in at $10 million with my next employer, whoever they may be, and say, I want $10 million, and they'll say, no. <laughs> um, based on our numbers you're and our business, we can't pay you that. Yeah, um, no, I, I believe that he would ask for that. Sure. Just, you're certainly not going to get it. My but question would a Mitch Marner contract be that much more than a William Nylander contract? Why wouldn't Mitch Marner's contract be comparable to David Pasternak's would be my question. After this year, I think it's going to be... If he takes off and has an 80-point season with Tavares... Yeah. Well, then why wouldn't yeah. it be comparable to Tarasenko. Leon Dreisaitl? I'm thinking Tarasenko or Gaudreau. Well, Gaudreau mm. is 8-2-5 and what's... Gaudreau's is not, no, nine? Gaudreau's not right. 8-2-5. Gaudreau's is 6.75. It's ridiculous. What? Wow. It's ridiculous. That's a good deal. I yeah. thought it was 8. Yeah. Yeah, that's a mistake. Why are you comparing it to a sweetheart deal then? Why wouldn't it be compared to Dreisaitl? Oh, there you go. Who's, in, uh, who's yeah. back-to-back so, so, so right. point five. The yes. argument would be that Dreisaitl's the center, I guess, would be the argument you use. But, sometimes sometimes not, though. <laughs> but I don't feel and like then, playing it. I want to play with Connor McNamee. And then this year, he goes out and he's playing with John Tavares, plus he gets all those power plays Time. Who knows? He puts up a 80, 70 point season. He says, okay, Dry Settle had back to back 70 point seasons. McDavid's Matthews. I'm Dry Settle in comparison. Give me my $8 million. You can prorate it. they will be closer to $9 million. The Dry Settle deal? We. Yeah, so no, what happens? I'm, I'm not feeling that. I feel I, like the Dry Settle deal, when you compare it to all the other comparables of guys who had the same points per game in that year, you look at Pasternak, you look at Ehlers, you look at those guys, 
it's a clear outlier. Like Peter Shirelli just messed up in that negotiation. He signed it too close to the McDavid extension. Drysaddle was coming off of a hot playoff well, run. I think McDavid's number came out first, and that was the, it. Were leaked. Remember it leaked. Yeah. Well, wasn't it thirteen? Twelve and a half. Or no, but when they no, no, said, oh, it was reported. Yeah, yeah. It was oh. reported. It was yeah. thirteen. Yeah. But that's the exact same situation next offseason. Matthews and Marner come up at the exact same time. Matthews' deal comes up. He says he gets $8 million. Marner's like, I'm not six compared to Matthews' 12 or 11 or whatever. Matthews is not getting $8 million. <laughs> Yo, that would be, I would kiss Kyle Dubas' feet. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Well, so. $8 million? I, I want the players to make what they're worth. And Matthews is worth that. Uh, but you also have to go, well, there's a cap. J- right? Jesse touched on something that I wanted to get in earlier with the, you know, the Sens want um, what uh, what they gave up for Duchesne. Or what, basically what the Avalanche got in exchange for Duchesne. Well, they're not going to get it because that's ridiculous. Well, I want this crazy, uh, I want this player to sign for this crazy uh, sweetheart deal. Well, you're not going to get it because it's a crazy sweetheart deal. Mm-hmm. Like there's a, there's a reason for that, you know? And then, and there's a lot of things out there. So I, I th- one of those would be Matthews for eight. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I miss I both. Die. I met Marner. No, no, no. no, no. Yeah. Comparing yeah. everyone yeah. to the Kucherov yeah. $4.7 million contract, comparing everyone to the, the Hampus Lindholm, what is it, $5.2 million contract. Right. Just like Kadri. Four and a half million, yeah. yeah. What? Thir- you can't even sign a third line center for that money anymore. No. Not a good one. Market's gone up. Yeah. Bozak got centers. more than that. Yeah. He did. Bozak played under Kadri all year last year, all year for the past two years. Got more than that. Again, if you prorate it, I think it would be above five million at the time that Kadri signed it. When you look at the percentage of the cap, yeah. But but as it, as the years go, and that yeah. and that's why the benefit of long term contracts for guys, you know, you hope they pan out. You're yeah. taking a bet. Um, you you hope that Sounds they don't good. get injured. Um, <sighs> yeah. Hey, listen, his cap percentage has gone down. Um, <laughs> yeah. But see, the, <laughs> brilliant. So I guess I guess to wrap up the 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 Mitch Willie and Austin contract situation, I I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned. What you said about Mitch Marner, and again, it's not because I don't like Mitch Marner. I think he's phenomenal, but I do think they are pretty close. And I, I can't see the huge difference, this chasm that people seem to see. And I wonder if it's because Mitch Marner has those moves that will break your ankles. And William Nylander seems to be just more of a, a fluid sort of guy. I think that's a pretty good argument because you watch William Nylander skate. It's just the smoothest stride you've ever seen. It looks like he's not trying, Mm -hmm. but he's flying up the ice. And I feel like Scott Niedermeyer had a a similar stride. Even Eric Carlson, when you see him going top speed, he doesn't look like he's trying too hard, but he's flying. He's soaring past people. With Mitch Marner, you can tell that he drinks Red Bull during the intermissions (laughs) because he's just a little maniac out there. So... I, I'm just looking at Marner's Instagram. He's got Chevrolet Canada stuff. He's got those insurance commercials. Like... He's a fun guy. He's a likable guy. Yeah. Like, he is a likable guy. Like he's gonna. He's making some money on this. I'm obviously That's a good. Leaf fan and want him at a sweetheart deal. Mitch, you're gonna make your money. <laughs> All right. Let this team win a cup and then make even more. Okay. Shut up with your cap hit. What's that Tampa Bay? You know, way of trying to get everyone to buy in. Get Stamkos in at last. Get Hedman in at last. Get Kucherov in at get last. Get Alex Killorn in way more. <laughs> and but, uh, Ryan but, Callahan. Yeah. Well, oh my God. <laughs> Dan whatever. Girardi. Like oh. more than you know, league minimum is is too much for him. I but. bet the Senators, if if they if the Lightning somehow pull off um, Carlson, I bet Dan Girardi goes the other way. I just bet because I bet Dorian would be like, well, he's a character guy. We're like, um. I, Steve, you wanted to bring up Tyler Bozak, and this uh, is a yes. this is a narrative I, that I think we've all heard. And Pierre uh, Pierre LeBrun in his article, uh, you know, one of the GMs that he canvassed, and I don't know if you've read this article with the Athletic yet, but it's so good because he goes and he he canvasses and he talks to several Eastern Conference GMs and several Western Conference executives and GMs, and it gets gets a sense of um, what the Leafs are going to be like this year. And oh, so certain so GMs are like, where I was going. Certain GMs are like, wow, this is amazing. And then another GM was like, I'm not sure Tavares was the right guy that they should have added. And I'm like, what? wow, I'm sure glad he's not running my team. But <laughs> they there is a narrative out there, and I want to get everybody's perspective on this, Jesse, Steve, and Ian. There is a narrative out there that suggests that, okay, yes, you did get the big shiny toy. You did sign John Tavares. He is a great hockey player. But you also lost. More than you gained. James Van Riemsdyk, Tyler Bozak, Leo Komarov, and Roman Polak. And, and Matt Martin. I was about to throw in well, Matt Martin Matt as well. Matt Martin too, too. And Josh yeah. Levo probably. 
Hey, John Stephen Brown. <laughs> um, Thomas Ooh. Placanics. Oh, yeah. playoff hero Thomas Placanics. Honestly, he's not wrong. Yeah, 109 PDO in the playoffs, Thomas Placanics. Oh, yeah. wow, Unbelievable. really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mitch Marner line mate. Yeah. Thomas Placanics. What, what do you say? to that narrative do you agree with that narrative do you disagree and if you do disagree what what is it that you say as a as a retort to it uh it's concerning for the fans of whatever team that person is in charge for uh because they haven't been paying attention to the toronto maple leafs uh they they're not just gonna have uh you know uh cadre on the third line and with no one on his wings, it's just two blank slots. The, the Leafs just throw him out there and two defenders. They're down five on three every time. They're being replaced by the young wingers that the Leafs have waiting in the wings. No pun intended. Uh, it's it's ridiculous. I mean, no one, no one they're going to bring in is going to put up the goal totals that JVR did. But Tavares just makes the team better. Jesse. Before before we get to your answer, I just want you to know that James Myrtle did tw- did tweet out that Ian was not to trust anything that you say. So did he tweet that? So whatever you say, Who just keep that in mind. James Myrtle said, there there said never tr- do not yeah. trust Jesse. Don't let Jesse get away with any shit. I've been, I've been warned about Jesse, and I'm like, Jesse seems like such a nice guy. Why is everyone warning me about See, Jesse? Yeah, that's <laughs> him bringing you in so that you can both rip on me later. That's how this works. It's not that they lost JVR, Bozak, Komarov, Matt Martin, and Roman uh, Polak. And Roman Polak. Do not forget that. Thomas Placanitz. <laughs> and Thomas Placanitz. <laughs> is that they added to Veras and didn't also add to the defense. I think that's where people's problems are. It's you bring in yeah. an offensive weapon when you finish third in goals last season. You're improving on a strength. Right. When your biggest weakness is just sitting there. I think that's what people are upset about and why a GM would be like, okay, they're good, but they're as good as last year. But a little better, but you didn't improve where you were weakest. I, I think that's a legitimate criticism. I mean, it's it's still something to be seen. Mm-hmm. There are some people out there who think the Leafs might try some creative things, and our friend Ian is one of them. I listened to your interview on uh, The Good Show. Like four times, <laughs> because every single time you introduce the idea of the Leafs having seven D, I was like, "That's stupid." And within ninety seconds, I'm like, "Damn it, they should do it." Well, here's the thing: whenever I bring up that idea, I think a lot of people. The counter argument is, "Oh, you could never do that for eighty two games," and I, I would never consider doing that for eighty two games. Like you, you tire out your centers pretty quickly. But I think in a big game situation, or let's say the playoffs. When you want to maximize your chances of winning, who do you have down the middle? You have Austin Matthews. You have J- um, I almost said JVR. Wow. You have John Tavares, mm-hmm. and you have Nazem Kadri. And let me just throw in there: you've got Patrick Marleau, who's played center. You've got William Nylander, who can. Mitch Marner, who did up until the NHL level. Like you got a team full of guys that can. And Mitch Marner, step he, didn't, in. he didn't play it. In, he wasn't. Uh, did he play in junior? In his last Not year, he was supposed month. to. He yeah. played for about two weeks. And they oh. put him back on the wing okay, because it, it wasn't working out. So, but, but. but you've got other options. Let's say someone. So you need someone for a shift. You can put Patrick Marlowe in. Even an injury, you can throw Marlowe in there for a few games. You can throw Nylander in there for a few games. I mean, they did with Marlowe last year, and I thought it was going to go terribly because it was Marlowe, Connor Brown, and Zach Hyman. I, I thought, oof, this is not going to go well. They did great it's together. Great I was line. shocked at how well that that line did. It made me think, wow, if, if you have an injury problem this year, Patrick Marlowe can spell in there at center since you refuse to ever try Nylander at center. But <laughs> Nylander can also play center. He's played it really well throughout his life. But the idea with the 7D 11 forwards there is that you just don't go with a fourth line center. And for all we know, Parland Hole might be great and he might be worth the eight or nine minutes he gets a night. But if you really need to win... Instead of giving Par Lindholm those minutes, you give those minutes to a mix of John Tavares, Austin Matthews, and Nazem Kadri, and have them go up against opposing fourth lines with the wingers that you have on that bottom line. Probably Tyler Ennis and Kasperi Kapanen, if we're being realistic. I think Kapanen should be in the top nine, but I suspect that Brown will get those minutes instead of Kapanen. That's another conversation for another day. But, um, <laughs> or maybe today. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think that the idea is that you can have someone like Tavares kill penalties because he's done it in the past. You can give the power play minutes to Austin Matthews, Nazem Kadri. Those guys are really good there. Tavares can obviously get some power play time too. But just spell those guys in on the fourth line because that way you can get each of them 20 
maybe 21 minutes for Tavares, 19 minutes for Kadri. But these are guys who you want to have on the ice as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And under a normal lineup construction, you're going to have like 18, 16, 15. If you're playing Nazem Kadri 15 minutes a night, that's just not enough for a player of his caliber. You know, you he's, too, get, he's too good to yeah. not play more. Or if you're only playing Austin Matthews, you know, he's only been playing 18 minutes a night these last few years. He needs more minutes. He doesn't need less minutes. So mm -hmm. you want to find a way to give your best players as many minutes as you can, especially towards the end of the season and in the playoffs. I think going with three centers and that allows you to have that seventh defenseman, maybe a penalty kill specialist, maybe someone like Ron Hainsey is the seventh D at five on five, but kills a lot of penalties. Yeah. Cause if you are playing him two minutes a row in a row in the playoffs, <laughs> which they did on penalty kill, if you are going to play Ron Hainsey and not shift him off, if you really don't trust any of your other defensemen, why play him at all for the rest of the game? Or at least play him like in, you know, maybe defensive zone situations sure. or like in late but game like, when you're winning. Sparingly, like, because yeah. he's old. Yeah. He's, don't, he's a nice car, but he's an older car. My Just suggestion for a penalty kill specialist would be Martin Marincin. That was the one area where I was like, I actually kind of like him. I think you might have heard my thoughts on Martin Marincin once or twice, well, but I'm, I mean, I'm basically his agent at this point. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. what we have seen, Ian, of Martin Marincin, or at least what we think we have seen, I test, because we're not all numbers people, right? What we think we've seen at the NHL level is a guy who's just below the NHL level, who who gets a little nervous uh, or when he screws up, he screws up big. Uh, there is a, a sense out there that he can't really skate that well, uh, that he's a bit of an oaf uh, with the he puck. So I mishandles the puck too often. He's an awful puck handler. Yeah. But so how do you how do you how do you justify that at the NHL level? Um, Zidane Ochara is not a very good puck handler um, Ron Hainsey's not a very good puck handler my question for you is what's the difference between Martin Marincin and Ron Hainsey I find that they're both a very similar skill sets they're both very good in neutral one zone defense <laughs> one shorter and younger well, but one shorter one's younger <laughs> I was going to say that's where Marincin's taller yeah. but yeah no, um, they're both very good in neutral zone defense they both are good at using their stick to deny zone entries and force the opposition to dump the puck in which we know like based on evidence results in you getting a lot less shots against you it's why Martin Marincin's always been a great shot suppressor at the NHL level both of them struggle at moving the puck. Both of them tend to defer to their partner because they're not the ones you want moving it. Ron Hainsey last year never really moved the puck. He either whipped it off the glass or reversed it to Riley. Probably the right choice, but... I freaking hate when they do that. It's frustrating, and we could get I into systemically that. maybe some changes we'll see this year. But Mark Marincin, phenomenal penalty killer. For everything he's not when it comes to moving the puck, when he doesn't have the puck and he's using his lawn stick to deny zone entries and take away passing lanes... He's an ostrich! He's, I mean, <laughs> Mike, Mike Babcock, yeah. before Ron Hainsey got here, said that Mark Marincha was probably their best penalty killer. And I know a lot of people don't realize that, but he's, he's really good at four and five. You watch the Marlies this year. He's a freak. Dude, people couldn't get past him. Him and Timothy Lilligren together as a pairing were no so kidding. fun to watch because you just couldn't get into the, the offensive zone if you're the other team because Lilligren has really improved his uh, gap control in transition. And he's, um, I don't know what the right word is, he's lanky, he's long. His arms, if you look at his wingspan, it's longer than the average person for his height. So he, he's a bit lankier and a bit better at using his stick to deny his own entries. Yeah, a but bit limier. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. We don't talk about wingspan at the NHL level when we should because... Who cares how tall your neck is? You know, it's how long your arms are when it comes to... It's like Chris yeah. Bosh, you know what I mean? Like, who cares how tall he is? It's how long your arms are. Someone mm. like Kawhi Leonard. Hey, there you go. Toronto transition. Yeah. He's what, six foot seven? Kawhi. Kawhi. Before you get Kawhi. Yelled. Sorry, yeah, Kawhi kill. Leonard. Sorry, Kawhi Leonard. Six foot seven, I think, but his arms are seven foot three long. That's why he's able to guard bigs. That's Have you why seen the picture of his hands? They're, he's like, he's got shack hands. He's got these massive yeah. hands. It's so funny. So it's crazy. Back to what I was saying about gap control. So Timothy Lilligren, Mark Marincham were excellent at denying zone entries. Marincham would always step up on a player, force them to dump it in. Lilligren would scoop back on that puck behind the net, make some magic happen, get out of their zone. And when they were on the ice, they had the best goal differential of any pairing in the, in the AHL. They were just phenomenal. You couldn't score when they were on the ice, and the puck was always in the offensive zone. So... I like Mark Marincin. I think he's a, a misunderstood player because I think we look at defensemen and we assume that you need to be this big physical guy who clears the front of the net or you need to be like a, a Morgan Riley who can just fly out of the zone with possession. I think when you look at guys like Marincin, when you look at guys like, I don't know, Chris Tanev, Nicholas Jalmerson, like... They're not good with the puck. They're not pretty to watch, but they're effective. Yeah. And I don't think that Martin Marincin's a top pairing defense. I don't even think he's a top four, but I think a lot of NHL teams could use him on their bottom pairing and as a penalty kill specialist. He stifles the rush. Yeah, it might not be Toronto because Toronto's left-hand side is stacked. They have Riley, they have Gardner, they have Dermott. Mm -hmm. I like Borgman. Hainsey's left-handed. You know, that left-hand side is pretty stacked. But Rosen, some, some, I mean, yeah, further down. Rosen looked phenomenal in the AHL so playoffs. Good. Dude was so confident with the puck. But... There's got to be a roster spot out there for Martin Marincin. 
There might not be. He might be Cody Franson. He might be exiled. You know, He's a bit right. defensive Levo. By the way, were you were just as a quick aside? Were you heartbroken that Cody Franzen has signed in the KHL? I kind of expected it to be honest. I mean, <laughs> last year he cleared waivers. It just seems like teams don't want him. Uh, that's another example of a player I think is just misunderstood. Like when he's on the ice, historically throughout his year, consistently every single year, his team is better when he's on the ice. When it comes to shots, when it comes to chances, when it comes to goals, like he's on the ice, his team out shoots, out chance, out scores the opposition. That's what you want. He's a bad skater. He can't really skate, and he can't really skate backwards too well. But if you look at the stats, when he's on the ice, the other team doesn't get controlled zone entries. So he's doing something well to control his gaps and transition and force them to dump the puck in. I think if you compare him usage-wise to some other players, people will say, oh, he's sheltered, he's sheltered, that's why, because coaches know that they can't trust him. Since 2015, which is the last three years, if you look at players... Ian's got his laptop. No, yeah, he's ready, ready, man. He's ready. I, I if this if would any come of you were up. like, how the hell is he doing this? <laughs> I mean, I knew this would come up. I had my Nylander stat in my head. I didn't need to look that one up for the power play no, stats. Oh, I would have never accused you. There are some stats that I have thing. up here, but this yeah. one I needed to have ready because everyone's going to say, oh, it's usage. He's sheltered. It's, he's, it's sheltered usage. That's why he did well. Here are some guys who had similar usage quality competition-wise. And managed to outshoot, outscore, and outchance the opposition since 2015. Brian Campbell, Radko Gudis, Matt Benning, Mark Pissick, Mark Barbario, Shane Goss, Despair, Brendan Smith, another interesting name who's been exiled, kind of, and Alex Petrovich. These are all guys who have been given that kind of quasi second pairing, third pairing usage. It's tough third pairing usage, but it's sheltered second pairing usage somewhere in between. And they've done well in those minutes. Cody France is one of those guys, but. We just seem to hate the tools that he has. We we hate the specific inputs we see in a player. But when he's on the ice, things are going well. He's doing something right. It's hard to pin down exactly what it is. Maybe it's his passing. Maybe it's the fact that he's six foot five and he has a long stick and he knows how to use it in the way to force the opposition to dump the puck in in the neutral zone. I don't know what it is specifically because I watch him and I kind of get it too. I go, what are you doing there, Cody? Like I'm not, not really sure what the plan is. Or on a, a power play on a five on four, you, you'll see him not backtrack. You're thinking, dude, you're a defenseman. Get the hell back there. So I understand why people have their problems with him, much like I understand why people don't like Jake Gardner, because he screws up fantastically, mm-hmm. and it blows up in his face. Hold on, Jake Gardner. Hold oh, no yeah. way. You don't say. You don't <laughs> that say. is a hot take. No way. Uh, no cool. way. We're going to hold on Jake Gardner. Don't get into him yet. But I think, it's, I think it's similar in that yeah. you get frustrated over specific components of a player's game. Yes. And yeah. You make up your mind, and you don't look at the aggregate results. Which is the Martin Marincin effect, too, right? And I think it's similar. I think over a large sample, if you're consistently driving shots and driving goals, which Martin Marincin also does, while facing heavier competition than people realize. When he played for Mike Babcock, Babcock played him against, you know, top four competition. Like, the, he would play him against, you know, top sixes. Maybe out of necessity a little bit. But. I'm not saying it was <laughs> ideal. I'm not saying that's what you would necessarily want. But in those 2015, 2016 years, you know, 2016, Oof. 2017, Marincin was playing a bit higher in the lineup than a lot of people think. A lot of people assume that he's one of those sheltered sixth, seventh Ds. When Babcock plays him, he plays him. Oh, I remember when he was on the first pair. With Morgan Riley. Scored a goal. They didn't do too awful together, all things considered. <laughs> well, I mean, considering I mean, what the defense compared, was at. Yeah. To in what, the same way that the Coyotes didn't do too awful down the stretch. Mm. I'd say they did better the than Riley and Hainsey did in the last four or five months of the season. Okay, yeah. would you? I want to ask you about, about something generally, and then we'll get into some specific players. In your opinion... What are the areas that the Leafs really need to make an improvement on this season to see success? Jesse mentioned defense, but is it, I mean, defense is such a big, when you really break it down, defense is so big, right? Yep. Everybody wants to get a player. That's everybody's instant solution. Let's get a player. They're obviously not going to do that, or at least haven't done that. So what do you do? And is defense the first thing you look at? Honestly, I understand the defensive concerns, and it's tricky to just snap your fingers and go, team defense, we're done, like that. I think Steve. I was going to say, I think you can replace a coach in the past who had no system and put in some kind of system, like what we're going to see in the New York Islanders this year. I think you're going to see much better defensive play from them because they didn't have a system before. You know, Mm. you watch them, it was kind of like... They didn't have a plan before, The Leafs of Randy Carlisle was just kind of like, what the hell was the plan there? You bring in Mike Babcock, all of a sudden there's a bit more structure. Mm -hmm. In 2015, 2016, the goals weren't there, but they outshot and they outchanced teams. That was a well-run team who got out of their zone with control. They they were watchable. You know what I find crazy <laughs> is that I like the way that that team broke out of their zone with control, and I don't like the way that the Leafs broke out with control last year. I really I hated the Leafs' zone exits. Why was that? So if you look at some numbers, Andrew Berkshire brings it up a lot. They led the league in stretch pass attempts mm-hmm. and had the lowest success rate on stretch passes. 
Yeah, oh, was well, that because they're trying them so often? I think that's naturally <laughs> going to be part of it. Yeah. But if you're so bad at something, why do you keep going back to it? Is the but question. Wasn't that, remember they had this stubborn several month long stretch? November, yeah. December, January. I remember it well. What the hell? And it was every game and it was. It got annoying to watch, even. Even the games where they won, I would, like, resent the fact that they won. I wanted them to lose yeah, so that they have, learned you something. You have to try those things in games for them to see if they work. You can't just try something once in practice and say, okay, this wasn't effective, let's not do it. You have to try it over a yeah. large sample size, and they did, and it didn't work, and then they went away from it. I'm not Overnight. sure. I'm not convinced <laughs> yeah, they so. fully went away from it, though, because I think there were elements that went away from it in the fact that they started generating a bit more offense. They started generating a bit more speed. I wonder how much of that was player based and lineup based as opposed to actually tactically based. Because January 23rd, January 24th, that's when the lineup overall happened. That's when Komarov went down to the fourth line. Matt Martin went to the press box. Mitch Forever. M- yeah, yeah. He's just gone. Never and then, came back. Except for yeah. Buffalo. Mitch like, Marner yeah. moved up and played with Kadri, and Kasperi Kapanen was a, a full time contributor mm-hmm. in the lineup. Yep. From that point onwards, you saw a lot more offense, a lot more goals. And the team looked like the team that we had known from the season before, too, right? But I don't think they looked like the team from October. The team from October, I, I will admit, was a bit of a defensive train wreck, but they were flying out God, of the zone with speed. They were, it, was, it was great to watch. And you had Nylander circling back in the zone to pick up a puck and then go up the ice on a three-on-three. And you, know, you have Matthews, Nylander with the puck in transition. Caught teams off guard. They can do things. They can do things with speed. I find that what the Leafs did this past year was a lot of flip-outs, a lot of uh, either off the glass or just yeah. a flip high into the neutral zone and get one of your players to chase it down. Do you want Mitch Marner or William Nylander to chase down the puck that's in the air? Or do you want the puck on their stick and for them to weave their way through the neutral zone? Because that's how you create suicide passes and get you get people injured too, I, right? I, I think in the 90s, but I, I, have you ever really seen that <laughs> many types? No one of, gets hit anymore, but... I'm not going to say people don't get hit, but I'm saying that it's a lot easier to break out of your zone with short passing than it well, is sorry, than it What was. I meant is the flip through the air. Oh, I don't the, want oh. them looking up when there's when there's defensemen right there. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you, you, that's, that's, how, that's how you can get hurt. I mean, if it was effective and if they were regaining possession of the puck, you know, 70, 80% of the time, I'd be down for it but it's a coin flip basically when you flip it up like that and i would argue that it's not even a coin flip because usually when you flip it up the opposition has more numbers back than you do skating forward and even if you win that battle for the puck a lot of the times i found that the wingers were waiting at the far blue line for the puck so if they actually got it they couldn't really do much with standing it still. And, they, and yeah they were standing still they were flat-footed they had to send it in they didn't have momentum to skate in for pressure. It was basically a giveaway to the other team. I felt that the way that they got up the ice was long stretch passes, long flips off the glass. Even Jake Gardner, who got out of the zone with control at a high rate for this team, didn't get out of the zone well relative to the league, and I think it was because of the types of breakouts they were going for. They were going for those home run stretch passes, and they weren't very effective, like Any I said. Any particular reason... Was that a strategy built in? Was that, or was that Mike Babcock trying to get? Like, is that a Mike Babcock thing, or is that the players kind of deviating from what that plan I think should be? It needs to be systemic at some point because if you look at a team like, let's say Vegas, you could see that the plan on their breakouts was very different than the plan on the Leafs' breakouts. Yeah. The plan on Vegas's breakout is defenseman like skates around his neck, makes a short pass to an open player. That player skates up, makes a short pass to the open player, and then you move up the ice as a unit. The Leafs' plan seemed to be get the puck the hell out of the zone and someone will either tip it in or hopefully you'll win a race, and then you might have an odd man rush the other way. I don't feel like that works against good teams. I feel like a team like Boston can easily weed that out, and they did in their series. They were exploited. And I also think when you, the only guys who can get out of zone with control are on your left side, Riley, Gardner, and Dermott. It's very easy to game plan against that. Send your four checkers to the right side of the ice when you're the opposition. That way it forces the left-handed defenseman on the other team to reverse it to Hainsey, to Polak, to Zaitsev. And then you're not going to get out of your zone with control very well. Right. So, right. Well, can I can I just say how proud I am of you that <laughs> you have not brought up. You have not even mentioned Travis Dermott once. Uh, it's been really hard, man. It's, <laughs> and I just this <laughs> whole conversation. I'm like, here it is. Here it comes. Nothing. So I, where does he play into all this? I love him so much. So here we go. Um, <laughs> yeah. Travis Dermott, uh, you might have seen him play once or twice last year. The dude it's can. Right. Uh, yeah. He's uh, okay. good old number three. Yeah, number three for what, two games? And then he was number, like that, number yeah. 23 for the rest of time. I've, I've always wanted to get a, a Dermot jersey, but I'm not sure if he's going to change his number now because if he's a full-time member of the team. That's when the players were allowed to choose their jersey number. I think a few guys might do that because yeah. they're allowed to have a high number now. For some reason, the highest number last year, 55, Borgman, rookie. Explain that yeah. one, Lou. Was there one between him and Gardner, or was 51 the next closest? Uh, 
I don't remember. Not that I can remember. I don't remember. Yeah. But yeah. And I, I bet you he didn't even like that one either. I bet you he was strongly <laughs> against that. And you're 55. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how fun would it have been to see like Mitch Marner be 93? Because Gilmore gave him permission. He right? might be. Yeah, but he yeah. can't. No, he can't because, oh, uh, because it's, it's retired, retired now. Yeah. That was the reason oh, it's they officially couldn't retired. Actually, okay. Yeah. All right. Be 94. They yeah. haven't retired Bears ends. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jonas, <laughs> Jonas Hoagland. <laughs> Number 20, I think. No, he was I don't 14. know what he was, yeah. no. no. Uh, but yeah, let's let, let, dive in on Travis Dermott. Oh, okay. All so right. Where is, the, is, is, is Travis Dermott? He's interesting because you, you are so stacked on the left side, like you mentioned. And people have said, oh, well, Travis Dermott was the left-handed guy behind Riley and Gardner, so of course he got favorable matchups, which I don't think is necessarily the case. He he did. When you look at quality of competition, like he was in the bottom, let's say, the bottom 20th percentile, the oh, okay. maybe even do- bottom 15th percentile. But I think the bigger aspect for me is looking at who his most common partner was. It was Roman Polak. And any research you look at will, sh- will tell you that quality of line mates is more important than the quality of your competition. And it That's, makes sense I did not when you know think that. About That's very interesting. I believe it. When you think yeah. about it, it makes sense. Let's say I play a game right now and and Steve's my partner. Steve, we're playing ESHL. You're right D. I'm left D. He's going to be my partner for 100% of those shifts. Now, let's say that there is line changing in this game, and it's like a real hockey game. Yeah. So we're partners for 100% of that game. We might face first lines 40% of the time. We might face second lines 30% of the time. Third lines 20% of the time. Fourth lines 10% of the time. There's variance there. There's change. You're always my partner. You're always going to be there impacting my results Whereas the opposition is changing throughout the course right. of the game wow. and throughout the course of the season. And that's naturally going to, it's going to level out a little bit. It doesn't level out entirely. And there's this argument that quality competition doesn't matter. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that relative to your teammates, it's not as important. It definitely matters. I mean, if, yeah. if you're outmatched by competition, you're outmatched by them some of the time. Yeah. If you're with a crappy partner, you're with them forever. You're strapped to that partner. Or at the same time, yeah. if you're strapped to Jake Gardner, like over the last three, four years, he's helping your numbers. Right. You know, if you're strapped to, I'm trying to think of a really good partner, let's say uh, Ryan McDonough. Or yeah, Ivan Provorov is a really good example. Ivan Provorov, really good defenseman. But when he was strapped to Andrew McDonald, didn't have good numbers. Played with Shane Gostisbehar last season. Did a little bit better. So mm-hmm. you know, he's a really good uh, looking player. Those are two off. very good yeah. defensemen. I love them. And they got Travis Sanheim. They got some. They got some players there. I like what Philadelphia is doing, especially in the back end. But back to Travis Dermott. So quality competition wasn't necessarily that high, but he played most of his minutes with Polak. This I don't need to shit on Polak any more than you guys probably have on the on the podcast. But not a modern defenseman. I did some research on. Uh, zone exits and looked at how much the impact results uh, transitionally surprise surprise they impacted a lot in fact uh, it's actually more important than denying zone entries so so, so explain that one again run us back through so, so, for, so for a layman all right okay so for me uh let's remember we talked about martin marinchin really good at forcing dump ins in neutral zone defense yes, because they tra- can't get around him, yeah right so that skill set actually isn't as important as getting out of your defensive zone with possession, either skating the puck out with control or making a pass out of your out of your defensive zone with control. Research shows that that is repeatedly going to impact goals more than the defensive aspect would. The defensive aspect still matters, still helps you prevent goals, but it's been proven that zone exits help you both contribute to scoring goals and preventing goals. It's both an offensive play and a defensive play. When you think about it, you're in the defensive zone with the puck. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a no-shit moment. You're behind your net, four checks coming at you. Things are scary. You're in a very vulnerable position where if you lose the puck, something very bad it's could happen. A couple problem. feet to the net. It's so, easy. If you can get out of your zone, that's a positive. That helps you defensively because now the oh-shit moment is gone. If you can get out of the zone with possession, now you're moving up the ice with the puck. You have a chance to create offense. So it's both a, de- a defensive play and an offensive play. So zone exits really matter. Back to what I was talking about. Roman Polak, zone exit wise, in my study I found was the worst in the league when it comes to both um, his ability to get the out. Worst in the league. Yeah, in terms of he never touches the puck. With the int- all the, the NHL. Like 800 whatever. Of players, of players in the sample. So of players who have played at least 250 minutes um, in the sample over the last two years. There's still in, in hundreds court. of players. Over yeah. two years. Yep, over two years. Yeah, and uh, that... Here, I can pull That wasn't just last now. season. Jeez. This is over the last two years. I didn't know he was that bad. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't really surprise you, though. When you throw in no. the team <laughs> effects of a team that doesn't really try to get out of the zone with control, that encourages them to flip it off the glass... He's an off-the-glass-and-out type of player. He's not a player who's going to skate it out himself. He's not a player who's going to make a, a little slip pass to the center in transition. He's off-the-glass-and-out. So 
His numbers, if you look at transitionally, he doesn't defend the blue line well in transition. He's not good like Martin Marincin at breaking up uh, plays of the blue line. So the, pl- the puck gets in puck gets into the zone. Yeah, he backs up onto his goaltender and tries to block the shot. Think Chris Russell. You know, he loves doing that. He likes right. being the hero who blocks the shot. Which is noble. It's very noble. Not noted, noted Leafs hero. In I one saw game. A Ray, great, Russell. Yeah. There was an amazing quote where um, Rasmus Ristolainen and blocks the shots that other defensemen don't even have the balls to allow. <laughs> I like that. Who said that? Uh, I think it was Yolo Pinato on Twitter. It was, uh, amazing. Uh, it's one of my favorite quotes. It's one of my favorite quotes. That's really good. Wa- like you shouldn't like blocking shots. Very noble. Like it's like a rat. You see a rat, you kill a rat. But if you have a lot of rats in your house, you, it might be indicative of a bigger problem. If you're always allowing guys into the zone and always have to go down to block the shot, it's probably because you're letting them into the defensive zone all the time. Right. So Roman Polak backs up onto his goalie a lot doesn't get out of the defensive zone with control. And then I have to ask yourself, if you're not transitionally helping us in defense, if you're not transitionally helping us offensively, in the modern game, how are you really helping us? And so I got two Polak questions then, because it sounds like you have a lot of the numbers. Was he actually good on the penalty kill? Hashtag actually good. Was he <laughs> actually good? Was he? Jeffler t-shirt. Over the last two years, um, it's hard to quantify penalty kill performance. One of those tricky things you have to adjust for usage. I found that he's pretty good, but throughout the course of his career, I found that he's nothing special, like about league average wise when it comes to preventing shots relative to your usage. I'm not. That doesn't mean he's a bad penalty killer. It just means that like the best penalty killers in the league tend to be the best defensemen in the league. You look at guys who are the right. best at suppressing shots on penalty kills. Guys like PK Subban. You know, it's guys like Eric Carlson when he's on the penalty kill. The other team doesn't shoot the puck because a lot of times they don't have the puck as often. He's that, good at that going. That was a knock against him when he won the Norris is that he didn't kill penalties. And then the next year, didn't he lead the league in block shots or something like yeah, that? Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid. Um, uh, th- sorry, what, my one more Polak thing is at 5-on-5, five five, which line did he play with the most? Third pairing. Oh, which line did he play with the most? Yeah, the it would have been. Group. They tended to play their third pairing with uh, the third line and the fourth line. They tended to give Interesting. them. Yeah. And they tended to play their matchup line, the Hainsey Riley line, as often as they could with Kadri and company. But again, it's hard to keep your lines together. Sometimes they were playing with Matthews and company. Sometimes they were playing with the fourth line. I think they very rarely played with uh, the JVR Bozak line because that tended to be a sheltered line that they yeah. didn't put out against the big units. But again, it's it's hard to look at quality of line mates with a defense pairing and offensive uh, lines for the same reason that we talked about with quality of competition because there's so much variance. You know, you might you might have. Uh, let's say a third pairing with Roman Polak. You might be playing with the third line. You might be playing with the fourth line. You might have a shift with the second line. You might even have a shift with the first line. There's a lot of variance. Whereas if you're Roman Polak, you're always playing with Travis Dermott. You know, you always have that good partner. Right. Conversely, if you're Travis Dermott, you're always playing with Roman Polak. That guy who doesn't get out of his own possession, doesn't help you transitionally. He's blocking shots that other defensemen don't have the balls to allow. You know, he's, he's doing that. <laughs> thing. <laughs> Travis Dermott, phenomenal at neutral zone defense. This is eye test. This is numbers. He's right on top of you. He's right in your jersey as you're breaking up the ice with the puck. He's not afraid to step up on someone's transition because he has the edge work to turn and stay with you. He doesn't get beat very often. Really good skater. And when he does, he can usually make up for it. And I used to have this problem with Riley because I found that Riley wasn't very aggressive in transition. And I'm like, dude, just step up on them. If you get beat, you can catch them because you're a fast skater. And Jake Gardner actually does that a lot too. You see a lot of broken up plays right at that red dot before the blue line. Um, Jesse, you look like you were going to say something there. Yeah, why why did Roman Polak play 17 minutes a night in 54 games if he's not good? Um, well, Mike Bobcock likes It's a likes question to pl- worth asking, yeah. for sure. <laughs> Why did Ron Hainsey play 22 minutes a night when he was 37 years old and was really struggling towards the end of the season? I think the Babcock has trust in players that are both veterans and players that he can trust defensively to not do something crazy, to not make a breakout pass in front of your own net and turn it over and it results in a goal, especially late in game situations he's protecting a lead. Turned to Hainsey a lot, turned to Polak a lot, turned to Zaitsev a lot. So those things, aren't they beneficial? Wouldn't you agree? It depends, because I think in the aggregate, over the course of a full season, if you're doing the safe play to constantly get out of the zone off the glass, um, it, it doesn't help you in the long run, because you want to get up the ice with possession. I think... There are situations where I can understand wanting a Polak, let's say with two minutes left in a, in a game where you have a one-goal lead on a penalty Fli- kill. Flipping a puck out? Yeah, sure. Fl- I'm not even lying. That's It can be a useful skill. If you can win a one-on-one battle, get the puck and flip it out, that matters. Like we talked about, that's a zone exit. That's not a controlled zone exit. So you're not getting up the ice with possession and creating offense, but you're getting out of your zone, you're clearing it. Final minute, you just need to go, oh shit! Yeah, yeah final yeah. minute, oh shit The is problem fine. is the oh shit in the final minutes when you're not killing a penalty 
you're still probably down because they're they're you know they're six on five normally if they're losing right and they're in your zone and then of course what happened i found with polak and this was my frustration with that line or with him and dermot and it wasn't really with dermot it was with him it was in those situations you put polak out there and he flips the puck out and he ices it so it brings it back the other issue that i had was every single time he did allow um he did allow someone win in with the puck it was either flipped in flipped by or skated by him and whenever he did regain control if that happened it had to go to dermot or it didn't get out and that was that's the problem and you mentioned it earlier it's this this situation where they had half the team could 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 uh, or half the de- defense could could get some sort of controlled zone exit. Riley Gardner Dermott. Sure, yeah. and then half the team couldn't. I, I Hainsey Zaitsev And that and that that window where you take a right where your right shot defenseman has to flip it over to your left shot defenseman. That if I'm an attacking team, if I'm an opposing team, that's where the mistakes happen. That's where I forecheck them hard because I can intercept those passes, especially You're in a playoff a hockey series. Dad. If, yeah. Especially in a playoff yeah. series, we have time to tactically plan for teams. Yeah, like, that is an area. See, I, everybody is kind of criticizing the play of the players but what it sounds like to me is you guys are criticizing the decision making of Mike Babcock 100% 100% I mean whoever's responsible for those I don't don't think you'd be blaming the players for playing the way they're told to play or the way they know how to play you should be criticizing the coach for throwing him out there with a minute to go is that 100%. Your problem? Uh, I agree with that. Honestly, I agree with, 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 that. A, with a minute to go, I'm not sure if it's the biggest deal with Roman Polak. I think it's halfway through the second period in a tie game where you're going off the glass and out. The other team's just going to pick that puck back up and come right back in. You didn't On your do side. It. And also, yeah. like, you have to mention Polak when criticizing Babcock. You know what I mean? Like Because that Babcock was one of the is misusing a player. Well, who's he misusing? Well, he's using misusing that player, right? Mm-hmm. Roman Polak. It sounds like it's criticism of Roman Polak, and I suppose it is, but it's more... It's more damning systems. of and this is, that, right? this Babcock spe- was not mentioned anywhere in that conversation. This is Fair, specific to Polak, by the way. I'm just yeah. using him as an example. I mean, any player who constantly flips the puck off the glass is going to be hurting the results. You look at guys like Chris Russell, Andrew McDonald, it's their go-to play. They like going off the glass and out because it's, to them it's a safe play. To me, I see that, and I see a, a guy who's giving the other team the puck when you were in control of it and you had a chance to do something with it to advance the puck up the ice and maybe create something offensively and you panicked, you gave it to them and now they're coming right back in your D zone. And uh, I know Kyle Dubas had a great quote about this at the Sloan conference. I want to say it was 2015 when he, right after he got hired by, uh, by Shanahan and he talked about how uh, there is this bias in coaching for guys who make the safe play guys who you are reliable and you can all oh, when, you know, when the chips are down, you can trust this guy to make the safe play. And if you're always going off the glass and out, if you're always making the safe play, you're going to spend most of your time in the defensive end. And that's not where you want to play. You want to play in the offensive end. So, so if, I, I, oh, sorry, go, go. I wonder if this is uh, another way of putting it. I look at guys like Dermot and Gardner and Riley in particular, at least when it came to the Leafs. Those guys, um, they were part of the Leafs' identity. Players like... Zaitsev, to some extent, Polak for sure, Hainsey, a guy like Chris Russell, I look at them as a part of the other team, the opposing team's identity. You know what I mean? Like, they almost don't have an existence without the opposing team. Their job is to go out there and just take the brunt, take the onslaught, whereas, like, Riley can do both, and he's the one that the other team is concerned about. The other team has no concern about those other players. They're not concerned about Ron Hainsey. They're not going, what do we do to get around him? You know what I mean? And I think it comes down to the word defense, and I don't like it when we're, eva- when we're talking about these players. It's because vague. It, well, no, what I think it is, is like if, if you call someone a defenseman, you're going to assume that their job is defense. And I think that that's um, uh, a misevaluation of what it is the players are doing. I know some people call them backs, like we do in soccer. I was just about to say they should be called backs. Some people call them guards. You know, like so I, I like Dom Lucician calls them a point guard because they get the puck behind their net and they got to advance it up the ice with possession. And they play you at know? the point. Yeah, so defense is something you do. It's not something you are. <laughs> like you do have to play D team. There is defense to be played it's just maybe not labeling the position is a little or you can have a defenseman who's not very good at defense and still be an incredible player because he's know? a good back yeah, yeah. Rom- roman yossi you know yeah uh, like so okay in jesse mentioned it there and he's absolutely right we didn't mention mike babcock but it was a general criticism of the way they were used and the system that they were running what has to change on this team with Mike, and it seems like he's open to new ideas. He did make some changes that were necessary last year, especially in January. Yep. Like you felt like for two months there, I felt like we were, it was like, 
it was just, it was almost, it was boring. It, it was, was like, oh, it was, it was this a game is, of chicken. I kept going, trust me, he's going to figure it out. Yeah. And it took him like, again, like you said, three months. And we wondered if it was like did. his punishment too for October where it was like, okay, you guys did freewheeling and now we're not going to do that. You're mm. going to learn to play this game a different way or whatever. So you're like winning games eight, five, do you? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What, what does Mike Babcock have to do as the coach of this team it's not necessarily changed but you know probably changed some things he's done some amazing amazing things since coming here he's also had some things where you can point it point at it and go well that's a weakness in the game and i think when we're evaluating mike babcock we have uh, a tendency to get very critical in leafs land and i think it's the nature of being any fan when you look at a lineup you're going to see that one player that you, that don't, you don't like, like on the fourth line mason and, raymond yeah oh, vancouver yeah that's, 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 that's my that's, example that third pairing defenseman who you say it should not be roman Pollock, it should be connor carrick how dare you and it creates a, a crap storm on twitter and it's just the na- it's the nature of being a fan it's i understand it I think if we're looking at what Mike Babcock did since he got here in 2015, 2016, how many of you guys can name the players on that team that were any good? Oh, they were any good? good. Uh, uh, JVR? Who was hurt like, for half the year. Can you even throw Kadri into that conversation? I think so. Because I think you can. He was good. He Riley just had Gardner, no shooting the percentage. Three guys yeah. left. Riley, JVR, Gomorrow, Riley and Gardner. Yeah. I think the point All-Star I'm trying to make. <laughs> the point All-Star is, Comrade. it wasn't a very good team. Talent-wise, there was nothing there. Structurally, that team played really well. That yeah. team got out of their zone with control well. They got into the off zone. They created chances. On the power play, they had the most shots and the most expected goals, or, or better word might be scoring chances on the power play. Shots from in close led the league in those on the power play. Shooting percentage was low. Talent it, wasn't there. Wasn't it like a really poor PDO? As yeah, well? yeah. Something like like their yeah. save percentage was in the toilet. Their shooting percentage was in the toilet. And you expect that to regress, and then they throw in some talent the next year. All of a sudden, they did a lot better. But I guess my point is 2015, 2016, very easily could have been a terrible team from a shot differential perspective. Could have spent a lot of time in their own defensive end, and you would have said, eh, what do you expect? It's not a very good roster. He got that team to play above 50% possession, above 50% scoring chances. Not many guys could do that, I don't think. So you're saying he got the team to do all these crazy things with no talent. Now that they have all this talent, what the hell is he doing? I'm Why not did he saying change that. Pers- it up? Exactly. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that I'm, I'm trying to put a feather in his cap and say, tip, tip of the hat to you, sir. That was very well done. I, I don't know many coaches who could have done what yeah, he did. Yeah, but they finished last. <laughs> <laughs> and also, that was three years ago. Like, but they were expected I, to, right? They were expected to be good. Can, can he control the shooting percentage? Can he control the save percentage? Yeah, I mean, they, they're the worst team in the league. Did you see the line? That they were playing in, in March and April. It, like let, let me go back terrible. to one of our. Rich, they did. Let me go back to one of our old Rich points. They were one of the best worst teams. <laughs> yeah. Which is one? actually true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think one of the best worst teams in history. When Rich Clune's playing on your top six and you can get him to outshoot the opposition, like I don't know what the hell you're doing as a coach. He but. assists on on former Leaf Brandon Leipzig's first NHL goal. How dare you? Was that the baseball bat swing? It was. was. That the, yeah, I love that. Well, that the Canucks goal. were wearing their cool jerseys. So then, yeah. to give Babcock a few more compliments before I criticize him, just because I think it's important that you realize that this guy is one hell of a coach. 2016, 2017, how easy would it have been for him to trust the veterans, ease the rookies their way into the lineup, not play Matthews in the first line? He had a line of three rookies, of Hyman, Matthews, and Nylander. He had Connor Brown, a rookie, playing very prominent minutes in a shutdown role of Kadri. He had Nikita Zaitsev, who'd never play a day of NHL hockey, but on his first pairing. Like, he did a lot of things that most mm-hmm. coaches wouldn't have done, and it paid off pretty well. That team made the playoffs. You can nitpick at things here and there, but he did a lot of good with that. And nobody was expecting that, by the way. No one was expecting that uh, team to make the playoffs. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you might have expected Jeff it. Jeff me, we had that actually, actually good hashtag going on. <laughs> oh, no, it's a weaving. Oh, That's oh weaving. I've been telling him. I've been oh, telling him. Wow. I've been telling Jeffler that he like I should get royalties for that because I said in what was it? So it was October when he put this the tweet out, or was it September when he put the tweet out of that year? I said in like the April before the season had even ended that I wouldn't be shocked if the Leafs made the playoffs next year when they were in last place. And I'm like, you're going to infuse a bunch of talent to this team. If you get league average goaltending on a team that outshoots and outchances the opposition, if you have a PDO of 100 and a and a shot differential of let's say 51 percent. That is logically an above average team. In theory, logically, they should make the playoffs. You know, how about, I'm sure. No, yes. Please, please. No, you, you I, was go first. Say, I, I was gonna say I, I'm coming out with my own shirts and mugs that say hashtag actually stolen. <laughs> that's that's all I'm here. I'm, I'm sure my royalties. I'm Jeff, sure when Jeff listens want. to this, I'm sure we can all agree that he will definitely not find a way to disagree with your statement. <laughs> and that he will find a way to say, I don't actually usually listen. <laughs> can I just say can I just say, <laughs> 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 The only reason the only reason I'm making this joke is 
because I love Jeff. Of he's, he's like one of my favorites. Obviously. He's, he's the dude who hired me on to Leafs Nation in the first place. Yeah. Like I wouldn't have been writing the athletic if it weren't for him. And so like I owe a lot he's of a it friend. to him. He's we a friend. We know. It's okay, man. But he's so- rich off of stolen <laughs> shirt. <laughs> <laughs> just, like, copyright infringement, man. Like he bought so many houses with that Teespring chain. <laughs> oh, man. So man, many houses. Don't, don't. He's, Jeff has made some shirt money. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, he's not even being facetious. So Mike Babcock's first two years as a Leafs coach did a lot of things that I was shocked. Like yeah. I, I did not expect a, a crappy 2015, 2016 to be out shooting and out chancing teams. I didn't expect the 2016, 2017 team. You know, as much as I proclaimed it to them to be the team of destiny to make the playoffs, it takes a coach to put the rookies in that position to, to have that success. And I don't know how many old school NHL head coaches would be willing to give that many minutes to rookies. Right. Especially right. the power play opportunities, the first line usage. Connor Brown in a prominent role in, on a shutdown line. How many coaches would do that? But I, I'm very impressed by that. 2017, 2018, I think there's an argument to be made that it was Babcock's worst year as a head coach in the NHL. Interesting. At, at least since the Detroit days. Because I'm not sure. I'd have to really think back to those Anaheim days. But mm. on Detroit, I mean, that team was a perennial contender basically every year he was there. Up until the talent had dried up, Lindstrom retired. And even then, you know the argument I made about the 2015, 2016 team that wasn't very good and he's mm-hmm. still gotten the good shot metrics? 20, what was it? Was it 2013, 2014? Datsuk was injured. Zetterberg was injured. Gustav Nyquist got called up and scored oh. like 40 goals that year. Well, I don't know, he was on pace for 40 goals. Oh, didn't actually score yeah. 40. But that team sucked. Like, the roster was awful. The defense was garbage. Lee, Danny fans, D- Lee fans should go back in time and go watch the HBO 24-7 from that year. Because yeah. Babcock is the coach of the Red Wings. There's a great scene of him standing in front of a marker board trying to figure out his lineup for that game, and he's just tearing his hair he's out probably because he's shit, got like, no one. Who the hell am I going to play on my top pairing tonight? Who the hell? Who's, who am I going to hard match against the other team's he top six line? Left-handed like, D. Thomas Tatar, like <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's no just, yeah. It, Jonathan Erickson. You're going to hard match him to the other team's top line? Is he going to play Crosby? You know what I mean? It's, I want to say like a rookie, Danny DeKaiser, was like second pair or something. Oh it was, man, it was brutal. It was not a good roster. Yeah. You got that team to the playoffs. They were they had some of the best shot metrics in the league. He implemented a, a, a neutral zone trap system because they didn't have the talent to break out with the speed and control like they did when they had Zedberg and Datsuk. He made it work. So, Ian, it's interesting that you say, okay, it's the worst, it's arguably the worst season. Well, I don't even know if it's arguably the worst season Mike Babcock had as a Leafs head coach, but you said it wasn't a great season for him. What what happened? And like quickly on what happened, because I think we kind of know, what needs to change? Uh, and to latch on to that question, I, we had this theory that we talked about that he did a lot of things in a way that weren't the best, but I think he knew that and he did them on purpose to, to sort of force a lesson. Like, for example, giving Komarov more minutes because of what he was doing off the ice, maybe, or because he was yeah. going hard for pucks in the corner and he wanted Marner and Nylander to bring that same attitude to their game. Yeah. Maybe playing Hainsey higher up in the lineup because yeah. of the off ice things. Yeah, like, yeah, trying I'm, I'm out like, Matt Martin for a season then pulling him back when we actually need to win. Yeah, yeah. and like yeah. I don't think he ever thought Marner or Nylander were fourth line players, but no, he played God, them there no. an awful lot. No. Yeah. But, like, I think that was more of a, you know, tough love situation where he's trying to get into be better defensive players. Right. And for what it's worth, as much as I love Marner and Nylander, I understand his frustration totally. sometimes mm-hmm. because um, when you're watching some of the forwards in the offensive zone, there are times where I've watched an odd man rush for the Leafs. Let's say that they have a, a defenseman like Riley jumping up into the rush, and then I see a fourth forward come in and go behind the net. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? You're supposed to be covering for Riley there. Right. And it's Marner or it's Nylander. And I go, this is why Babcock is, is getting you go, frustrated. Oh, Gardner blew the blue line. Yeah. Well, he had. Well, if he, he if, if should have had support and if didn't. If F three was there, then we wouldn't yeah. be talking about that that odd man rush because it would have been a two on two. But uh, it's it's those situations where I can understand where Babcock gets frustrated. Not saying that I would you know have a, a player like Marner and Elander on the fourth line for long term duty or anything, but I don't think he did either. I think he had them right. there for a few games here, a few games there. And I, I never had a problem with that per se. I think the bigger problem I had was with how many minutes he was giving Leo Komarov throughout the season. Yeah, there was, there one, was that one press conference where like, he was like, he played 24 th- minutes. 24 minutes. He's like, oh, that's too much. He's like, no, he no, he didn't. No, he didn't. That, that, like, that no, can't be right. And no, he did. <laughs> no, he really this is did. Objective. <laughs> this is like, so, well, I mean, yeah. but you got to. All that's your opinion. <laughs> you got you to gotta think he knows that. This is a guy who knows that. I think sometimes in games you can get a bit lost in the situation and be like, oh, it's a big PK, throw Komarov out there. Like, oh, crap, like two minutes left in the game, get Komarov out there, big defensive zone face-off, get Komarov out there. 
have him be on the secondary power play unit where he probably shouldn't be, have him playing three on three where he probably shouldn't be. And then he looked, all, he looked done at the end of last season. He looked Tom done for most dumb. of last season, done. unfortunately. And I love the guy. I love him with all my heart. I feel bad for him, but I'm glad that he got his money in New York. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure how effective he's going to be, but he, he, I'm glad he got it. To Komarov's credit, at the end of the season, the, the play that ended up taking him out in game one against Boston, it looked pretty benign and it just seemed like one of those things that was waiting to happen or one of those things like where he, he had an injury I'm yeah. yeah. wondering if he was hurt last year I'm wondering if he was hurt for was. a lot of last year because we didn't see the same you know I don't want to say angry but that like gritty Leo Komarov going hard in the corners finishing his checks yeah. among the league leaders yeah. and hits he just wasn't and and he's just I'm not, not the type of guy to be like oh yeah I'm really hurt today like, or he's not, he's not the kind of guy who's just like, you know, not going to go hard on the four track because that's who he is as a player. But he, he just he didn't look the same. So I think back to what you were asking me about um, Mike Babcock, you asked what needs to change or, or maybe what went wrong, what went wrong last what season yeah. that's different than what we'd seen in previous seasons. And I think Mike Babcock's always been good at adjusting his team style of play to the players that he has. And I think if you look at the teams he had back in the day with Lidstrom, Datsuk, they were very good at maintaining puck possession, outlet passes went through Rafalski and Lidstrom made a lot of sense. If you look at possession numbers, those are the best possession teams of all time. The ones in Detroit through 2007, 2008, 2009, we're talking like 60% possession. It was stupid. <laughs> when Datsuk was on the ice, it was like 70%. It was just nuts. It was unfair. It was ridiculous. Um, I think, you know, that Detroit team, that crappy Detroit team 2013-2014 when uh, Zetterberg and Datsuk were injured, he put in a, a nice neutral trap zone defense play because their defense weren't good enough to stop them in a, in a back and forth racing kind of game. So if you really clog the game down, maybe you can play to your team's benefit. It worked out. They outshot teams, they outchance teams, they outscored teams, and they made it to the playoffs when they probably shouldn't. And that's the game. Yep. 2015, 2016, 2016, 2017. I thought he did some good things this past year. The team's strengths, in my opinion, are like their skill up front, obviously. I mean, you have guys like Matthews, Nylander, Marner, uh, Kadri, now, the next year, we're going to see Andreas Janssen, Kapanen, some guy named John Tavares, who I've heard is pretty good. Yeah. These guys are all so good at carrying the puck from the defensive zone to the offensive zone, weaving their way through traffic in, in the neutral zone, and getting into the offensive zone with control and setting up plays. Last year, they were going for a lot of those, like I said, those home run stretch passes, those flip-ups, those chase downs. That would be great for a guy like Carl Hagelin, for a guy like Michael Grabner, who has the speed to win the puck race and you know fly with it in an odd man rush but can't necessarily do it by taking the puck from the defensive zone or the offensive zone. You try giving the puck to Michael Grabner and ask him to slice through a neutral zone trap, it's not going to happen. He's going to try skating as fast as he can full speed, and he'll run into a defenseman and fall on his ass. Maybe he'll score, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, guys like Nylander, guys like Marner, Matthews, Kadri, Tavares, Janssen, Kapanen, these are guys who you can give them the puck in their own zone, with speed and tell them to skate up the ice with control, have a few passing options go with them, and they can create offense that way. They don't need a, a long pass, stretch pass to, to generate that space for themselves. So I think what you need to see is a more it's funny this team who plays really fast and plays like you know like a very high high pace fast skilled team i think they need a slower breakout you don't need to rush it with mm. the long stretch don't rush pass. the breakout don't rush but the then, breakout but then the rush itself build, will be fast build right? up the build up the ice with speed and with control i think is the theme give Nylander the puck you know, have the wingers come down closer for support on the breakouts. Have guys like Marner, have guys like Nylander, instead of telling them to blow the zone and go for the far blue line, have them come deeper in the defensive zone, closer to the middle of the ice, closer to, say, the walls, the dots, to be there for that support for the pass. So that if Matthews gets, you know, he does, he's running out of space, he dishes it off to Nylander, who can now skate out of the zone with possession. I think that's the biggest problem that we saw with last year's teams. A lot of conceding possession when you didn't necessarily have to. When you went off the glass, when you flipped into the middle of the ice, when you went for that long stretch pass, dump in, basically just giving it to the other team behind their net. You didn't need to concede possession in that place because you had skilled players who can get the puck up the ice with possession. Think of a, a very skilled soccer team. Think of Manchester City, is coached by uh, Pep Guardiola. You think of Barcelona, you think of Real Madrid, you think of Bayern Munich, think of the best soccer teams in the world. Would they just whip the ball up as fast as, you know, right off the draw and, and, and hope that their striker can win a header for a goal right off the bat? They don't do that. They slowly build up with possession because they have the skill to do that. Less skilled teams like Stoke City back in the day, they used to just bomb like crosses into the box and try to get their six foot six guy to head it in. Or, or they used to go for these long throw ins because they knew they didn't have the skill to advance the ball closer to the crease. So they just had to chuck it there and hope for something good to happen. 
the talented teams don't need to do that. They can ease their way through teams because they have the skill to do that. And I think the Leafs up front are arguably the most talented team in the league when it comes to the depth that they have at forward. You think of running a third line of Janssen, Kadri, Kapanen, let's say, I think it's going to be Janssen, Kadri, Brown in until, all likelihood. Until Brown loses that spot, which I'd like could this, happen you know, in training camp. Man, unless he doesn't. Listen, and I just I know how much Babcock likes Connor Brown, and sure. I have to think it's his spot to lose, and I think sure. that means a couple months of him playing with Kadri and Janssen. But. You know, and another guy who I've wa- I watched one of those videos that was every goal. I think it was every goal and assist from this past season was Andreas Janssen. Love him so much. I <laughs> love him, and I'm more and more convinced he's actually a pretty good good JVR replacement. I didn't realize how much of a goal suck he was. Like he's he's kind of a gritty dirty player in front of the net. Goes to the dirty areas. Yeah, but he can also I trust him more to rush the puck in. I just felt like whenever JVR wasn't in front of the net, I didn't know he was there. I think we need you to know? be careful just assuming that JVR being gone is 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 not nothing because oh, it's something. It, no, it's, I mean, when yeah. he's on the ice, I think he gets um I, I think misidentified as like a power play specialist who isn't that good 5 on 5. Over the last two years, in his sheltered usage, he has some of the best numbers in the league. If you compare him to other players who have that sheltered usage, they're not even close. Like, they're there, all right. They might outshoot a little bit. He absolutely dominates the opposition when he's on the ice. And this is while playing with guys like Connor Brown and Tyler Bozak. That line was one of the most dominant third lines in hockey last year. I and mean, you have to ask I yourself, like, that line. I don't know it's why funny. you watch it and you think like, I don't know how they're doing it, but they're doing it. And yeah. I feel like JVR is a big component of it. Having that guy in tight who can score, who can... I feel like his presence close to the net draws a lot of attention and opens up space for his line mates. That's my theory. That's probably true. But yeah. I, he's, he's great when he's on the ice. Mm-hmm. So Okay, so that's very interesting. So I, I often criticize that line because I just didn't like what I saw. And then people would be like, well, actually, take a look at these they numbers. 60% of the shots, 60% of the chances. I mean, that's good. <laughs> so they were pretty sick. And then, but then this, so I brought this up earlier and I'll bring it back now because it's relevant again. Um, I saw, I, I think it might have been you. Someone was like, I don't get where this perception of Tyler Bozak came from. Like, why are so many people down on him? Maybe it wasn't you, it was someone else. And part of me understood because over the last couple of years, yeah, he's completely changed the type of player he is. You know, Babcock used him better. He's, he's been a very good part of the Toronto Maple Leafs. The other part of me was like, we spent the better part of half a decade yelling and screaming that this guy was the poster boy of like the Carlisle era and we know exactly why he's perceived as he is. Why is everyone acting surprised after two good ones? I think he was so misused in the Carlisle era so misused, that it just yes. warped the perception on him and Probably. we were being told that he was a defensive specialist who won face-offs. Which literally never. That couldn't have been less good, true. Good face-off Pretty guy. good face-off guy and but got better it. as he came to the Babcock teams. Like when he yep. was on the Carlisle team we were being told that he was a face-off specialist when he won like 52% of his face-offs. That's good. That's not a specialist. No. Yeah. Um, and he's he not- might have been the Leafs face-off specialist. <laughs> For sure. But he's For not sure. a face-off specialist. Yeah. Right. But uh, I think when you shelter him, you put him in the offensive zone and you give him some players who can do some things with the passes that he gives him, he's an effective player. Not worth $5 million over multiple years as he's aging into his 30s, but I do think he's one of those underappreciated players who and he- you're not going to miss until he's gone, but you're not going to miss him when John Tavares is the replacement. Yeah. <laughs> like, right, that's right, right. Right. Yeah, I mean, he, he might have come back. Had uh, he might have been the guy that came back if, if because um, I know they were apparently they had him. They had who was the other guy? Um, you thinking Lars Eller? No, they had another center. Who's this? I, why do I keep thinking it's not Jordan Wheel? That was the, a different off season, but there was another center that signed in Calgary. Derek that they, Ryan. Derek Ryan. Uh, who was going to be the third line guy? Maybe Tyler Bozak comes back. I want to say Tavares... Bozak signed before the Tavares announcement, and that made me go. Well, so did Derek Ryan. Really? So did Derek Ryan. Uh, okay. But that was the thing. The report came out that day that all of a sudden, every single everybody that the Leafs were talking to, the Leafs just stopped calling them. Mm-hmm. And that's that when so it started to come out. And then about fifteen minutes later, I think it was Elliot Friedman that that oh. said Toronto seven or said, yeah eight years or whatever. Or seven Islanders years fans are going to hate this, but I would love to know when Tavares made his decision. I'd love to know the moment he decided I'm a Toronto Maple Leaf because I'm just going to say it. I think it was. I think it was a lot. A lot further away from July 1st than people think. Steve, it was when he was five and he put on pajamas. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, when he maybe. Made the yeah. Maybe, why man. Did, why did you wait to the very last minute then? Like, I I, I don't want to say too much, but like, I, I know that the, the call that he was on with the Leafs and with the, the Islanders, like, that went pretty late into the, the night or two before. Like, 
Why are you waiting that long if you've already made up your mind? I, yeah. I think he wanted to stay home like just because he's a loyal guy. I feel like it was New York or Toronto, probably. That just makes sense, logically. But I, I want to throw something out there before. There's a couple guys I want to get your, your thoughts on, and then we got to do the press conference and wrap it up. But did you know that Tavares actually ended up hurting Boston? Did you, did you know that? This offseason? Yes. So oh. John Tavares hurt Boston this offseason. Can you guess how? Their feelings. Well, yeah, you're close. Oh. By, by being friends with the guy, Matt Barzell, that they should have drafted with one of those picks. <laughs> <laughs> no, <yeah. laughs> no, yes. Um, he, hurt, he hurt someone's feelings on the Boston Bruins. And it wasn't really actually him that hurt the feelings. It was the Boston Bruins that hurt the feelings of their own player, David Krejci. Uh, has come out and said, and according to Joe Haggerty in NBC, he said, listen, I know that, when, or I knew back then, I, they didn't call me or anything, I have a no trade clause, but I knew that if they signed him, I would be the one that had to go. That so was he's interesting. Ups- so he's upset about it. I actually can pull a, pull the clip yeah. up here. And that, I thought that was interesting. I'm like, well, the least won game seven of free agency then. <laughs> Because, because damn it, we got them somehow. <laughs> he said, I didn't get any phone calls from anyone from the Bruins. I know that I have a no trade clause, so they would have to call me if they did, and I'm signing Tavares. Yeah, it wasn't kind of something I enjoyed, but it was over pretty quick. Quick couple weeks. It is what it is. Krejci is 32. On a bad contract. Three years Seven remaining. Mil, right? 7.25 per year, three years and left. And I like Oi. him as a player. He's just not worth that anymore. No. Right. And let's not forget that David Backus also makes an obnoxious amount of money, too. He's. It's funny. That's he's the guy that would tried to tr- sell on. Krejci's at that age where you know when he has a bad season, you go, "Well, maybe it's a one-off," and then it keeps going, and you're like, "Oh shoot, he's done." Oh no. Yeah, I feel like it's hard trying to evaluate any second line player on the Bruins because anytime you look at like their relative numbers, well, when they're off the ice, Patrice Bergeron is on the ice, destroying worlds with Marshan and Pasternak. So Such you, an unfair. You point. don't have it. You don't have it very easy. So, so quickly on a few players, okay, um, uh, and then we'll get to the press conference. Justin Hall. Justin Hall, mm-hmm. I think I'm I'm with you on this one, Adam. I know you're a big Hall fan. Um, team Hall. I hope he makes a team this year. I think he gets a really good look. I know that a lot of people who are in the Marlies organization, who has now been promoted to the Leafs organization, were very high on Justin Hall, wanted him to get a look, and didn't get a look. Dubas. And, and company, and a lot of people who worked for that team. So I think Keith. he's, he's going to get a good look and in, in preseason. Uh, we'll see what happens. I'm not... Completely sold on Ojiganov, who I think you're going to bring up next, maybe. But mm-hmm. I like Justin Hall. I like his game. Hall, sorry. I like Justin Hall. He's He can move the puck out of his zone with possession. He can kill penalties. I like to see him as like the Polak replacement in that he's obviously not a physical player who's going to intimidate, but he's a guy who can throw it in the second unit PK who can drive results in the modern game. He's not going to whip the puck off the glass if he doesn't see anything. He's going to wait behind his net for something to develop. And I think that's the modern day defenseman that you want. He's six foot three. He's right handed. He can skate. He's mobile. Mm-hmm. It's funny. These are all attributes that you would want in a player, but he seems to be like really, I feel like underrated, undervalued, kind of flying under the radar. And I, I feel like he makes some noise and hops onto the team, even if it's just as the seventh defenseman this year. When you were talking about like guys who rush the puck out, a controlled zone exit, I'm like, well, that's Justin Hall, man. Yeah. Like, that, that's his game. He's almost like a rover at times. He, like the, the one thing I worry about is the Leafs seemed like weak with their F3 last year. Yeah. And I'm like, they better be on their toes when Justin Hall is on the ice because he likes to take it for a walk. And I think that's the big thing with Babcock, and that might be why they played a less aggressive style last year is because he knew that the, the F3 wasn't always going to be back. I yeah. think that's something you really need to see hammered home this year but I mean Justin Hall man like he on the Marlies they gave him freedom to skate the puck out when he wanted and he could zip through the neutral zone and, and go through players probably would be able to do it as well at the NHL level but think of someone like Andreas Borgman you give him sheltered usage Borgman was able to wheel around his net and go through some guys in the neutral zone I think Hall you could see doing the same thing if he's going out against third and fourth liners so hmm. we'll see again like maybe he doesn't make the team he's back in the AHL back in the minors very soon but I like, I'd like to see him get a shot because I think he can play. Igor Ozhiganov. Igor Ozhiganov. This is a tricky one because most of us haven't seen him play too often. Mystery box. Based on the scouting reports I've heard, um, just if you were to compare him to Zaitsev, who's the natural comparison who came over from Russia, not as fast, not as good at moving the puck, more of a like penalty killer, big shot. I don't want to say physical in the Polak sense because I feel like that's a, a condescending way of saying that a player can't move the puck and isn't very good, but I think we should temper our expectations on him. 
who knows? It might be like a, a Borgman situation where you get something that's really good that you really like the the tools that you see. But I'm uh, I'm cautiously pessimistic on him just because I, I think it's when you consider the D that are in front of him, Carrick and Hall under the old organization. I bet you Ozhiganov would have made the team based on the tools that he has under this new regime. Knowing how much Dubis values Carrick and Hall, I think that Ozhiganov's the odd man looking in. <laughs> I was about to say Connor Carrick. Uh, well, I'm going to say Zaitsev, and then we'll get to Connor Carrick because he brought Zaitsev up. Mm. But you're right. Let's go. Sure. We'll go. We'll go Zaitsev Carrick. Z- okay, okay, so Zaitsev first. Yeah. No one knows what the hell Zaitsev is. It's he's an enigma. It's confusing. It's this guy who has all these great tools. He can fly up and down the ice with the puck. He, you look at his highlights in the KHL. You go, oh my god, this guy's going to be an all star because he just has these tools that that make you go wow. But then he has these habits that I know we were talking about Chris Russell earlier. He reminds me of Chris Russell when it comes to his habits in that he gives guys space in transition. He backs up onto his goalie and tries to block the shot instead of stopping the play in the neutral zone before it gets to that point. And he has the skating skills to be and able to do that, right? this is what bothers me the most right. is that he's a great skater. I mean, have you seen that clip of him staying stride for stride with Ovechkin as he skates backwards in transition? Here's a guy who can tr- control his gaps if he wanted to be aggressive. I think he's talked with, was it... Jonas Siegel before about how he's just naturally a bit scared of, of making mistakes. So he plays a bit more safe. I think they need to drill into his head that we want you to make a play because you have the talent to make a play, you know, mm-hmm. wheel with and the safe is not safe in that situation. Safe is, is death. In my opinion, it's, it's death by a thousand paper cuts. If you're constantly giving the other team, the puck off the glass, cause they're just going to come back in with it. If you get out of your zone, let's say six out of four times, four of those times you don't make it. Well, six of those times you did. And you're moving up the puck, moving up the ice with possession. And then, you know, 60% possession for your mm-hmm. team, 40% for the other team. That's a good thing. That's a net positive. And I think they need to drill that into his mind because I think he has the skills to be good. I think when you looked at when he got back from his leg injury in March, April, the shot metrics were great. Him and Jake Gardner were the best pair, well, the better pairing of the top four between them, those two, and, and Riley and Hainsey. But, I mean, we have a long history of him struggling to get out of the zone with possession, struggling to control his gaps and transition, struggling to drive possession in any meaningful way. So the nerd in me says that we should be pessimistic about Zaitsev, but seeing the skills, seeing the talent, seeing the confidence that he like was building off towards the end of the season, there. I think he could be an X Factor this year, and I think he's... I think he's proven over the past two years that he's more of a number five, but I think that if he has a big year, he could be a three or a four and could really be the difference maker on this Leafs team. If Zaitsev has a good year, that changes a lot for the Leafs. And nothing a, wrong with a three, four, making four, two, five or whatever it is he makes. Right? But if he's, if he's a number five, if he's a Chris Russell, all of a sudden it's a problem. So I think this is going to be the year where we know what Zaitsev is because no more excuses, yeah. no more health, this no more, no more first year on North American ice was adapting to the play was, you know, p- facing really tough competition. My first time ever. No, you're going to be getting second pairing usage. You're healthy, you're acclimatized to the league and the country. Let's see what you got. I think he has a much better year than some of the nerds are expecting, but I don't think it's going to be as good as maybe some of his uh, biggest supporters think. I think maybe a number four defenseman. Not ideal with the contract, but better than a lot of people think. And that better as years go on. Reasonable, and I'm not a fan. Yeah, I know. Reasonable takes are the worst, aren't they? Like ice, Ugh. ice, like cool takes. Just yeah. Room like... temperature takes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Connor Carrick. Um, I really like Connor Carrick. I feel like we forget about the year he played with Jake Gardner, and those two were awesome together on the second pairing. Because it's funny, we've seen Jake Gardner play with a bunch of different pairings. He's played with Cody Franson and done really well. He's played with Dion Phaneuf and made him tradable. You know, like Jake Gardner <laughs> plays well with That's everyone. True. Jake, Gar- <laughs> Jake Gardner struggled with Nikita Zaitsev. Those two, for whatever reason, just don't click together. Gardner and Carrick clicked. They got out of their zone yeah. possession really well. Like those two were two of the best on the Leafs that year. The only defenseman who was better at it was uh, Morgan Riley. Who I've so heard do you try as a Zaitsev Riley parent? I don't know. I feel like we saw that it didn't really work too yeah. well. The first. I don't know what you do to be honest about this Leafs defense. I think you can't do Zaitsev Hainsey because that that sucked. I mean, maybe you shelter the piss out of them, but I feel like Babcock wouldn't if you put those two together. No, you know, that's his shutdown pair. <laughs> um, a question for you guys. What would you do with the Leafs pairings? Because I've floated around some different ideas. I like the Gardner-Riley idea. I, that's that's my favorite idea because then you can go Dermot Zaitsev. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if we see it. And I'm worried that we go riley Hainsey for way too long again this year and, and Mike Babcock just doesn't change his mind on a player who he should. But then again, he did come around on Leo Komarov so there's always it that potential. While, yeah. yeah. Or he came around to Matt Martin in that he played Kasperi Kapan in the lineup for the last four months of the season. So I think in the in the split second that it takes you to twist your body 
uh, over to the backhand to keep a puck in, say, on you know, when you were talking about left and right defense. Um, if I'm going with anybody on their wrong side, it's going to be the young guy because you uh, your ability to twist as you get older gets slower and slower and slower, and those split seconds matter. I would try Travis Dermott on the left side, or sorry, on the right side, and I would put him either with uh, I would put him in a, in a Jake Gardner situation. So I, I like Gardner Dermott, actually. Yeah. And what I'd like to see is somebody else step up with Morgan Riley. And I don't I don't know. I, I mean, I like the fact that I love a Gardner-Riley pairing together. My question is, after that, is I hope Zaitsev and Dermott would work well together. But yeah. I would like to see something along the lines of, I think, what, what would be the problem? Is, is Connor Carrick... Less, so much less talented that he couldn't make Morgan Riley look good. Again, I think the problem there is if you're playing him with Morgan Riley, Bobcock likes to pair Riley against the other team's best players. He really likes Morgan. Can Connor Riley. Carrick not keep up on that? I don't think Babcock trusts him. I don't think it's going to happen, is the point. I think he he could do a lot better than people would be expecting. I don't think it would be great. I don't think he's a top... I don't think he's a top three NHL defenseman. He might be able to squeeze in as a number four if he makes some improvements to his game, but... He's, you're never going to see Mike Babcock give Connor Carrick tough minutes. You're just not going to see it. He's sheltered him throughout his entire career. He's played him, I mean, as the number six last year when he was with Gardner, he sheltered him a bit at five right. on five. So okay. I, I just don't think you're going to see it. Yeah, it's like you have, I think, Hainsey ideally as a third pairing defender or even seventh guy. Honestly, I do. And I, I know I'll that that's eat not my what, Rough Riders jersey if Babcock does that. Would you do it if he made Hainsey the five with lots of penalty kill time? See, I like that. That's where I think he belongs. That's what, that's what he did with I don't Komarov. I think he does that. He did that with Komarov later in the year. Put him on the fourth line, made him a penalty kill specialist. If that's what he does, great. I just, it's like we were saying, yeah. I just, I don't have and faith in that. Like the idea of having, like you, you've you've mentioned Dermot on the right side yeah. several times. Or or Riley on the right game. side. Just move one of your better players one over to the right side so that it's not Hainsey. Then there's Ojiganov, who is a mystery box. Carrick, who we think is good, but Babcock, for whatever reason, doesn't really seem to trust. And Justin Hall, who a lot of people think should make it. I don't really think he serves box. a purpose. We, we, need, we need to see him, but like, yeah. yeah. I don't, don't think know. he serves a purpose in the AHL anymore, really. Um, so That's why I don't mind him as the seventh D. Like, hypothetically, like if he doesn't make the team, why not have Justin Hall there for, you know, you're spelling Connor Carrick on a back-to-back, throw Hall in there, see what he's got. Yeah. Something yep. like that. With Levo, I was like, not this past year so much, but the year before, I'm like, you're wasting this guy's time. You know, and I understand the whole waivers thing, whatever. Uh, Justin Hall is 27? 26. 26. 26, going on 27. Like, give that spot in the lineup. Uh, to someone else and yeah he can be your seventh guy another thing I would really like to see the Leafs do a lot more this year is they had so many occasions last year where they had back-to-backs and they could have not only swapped one guy out they could have swapped out an entire pairing and they didn't do it give Hainsey back-to-backs off he's he's, he's turning 38 this year man yes like you're gonna make the playoffs unless Matthews Tavares or Anderson suffer a major injury Mm mm-hmm this team makes the playoffs, right? Like it's it's very unlikely that they don't. Something drastically bad would need to happen. But otherwise, you have like the freedom to be a bit creative, be a bit more innovative, follow what a lot of basketball teams are doing, and they're realizing that this regular season doesn't really matter. Like, mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> it, it really doesn't, yeah, especially lock, in a, in a sport, lock up your spot and... in a sport like the NHL. Like it's it's a shit show in the playoffs. So if if you can just there's so much up to chance. Yeah. yeah. So. Two more, two more guys before we get to the press conference here quickly. Um, Andreas Janssen, Carl Grundstrom. Ooh, who do you want me to start with? Uh, Janssen, Janssen, because I, I think we know a little more about him. Okay, so Janssen, um, point per game player in the AHL last year. Actually, was a point per game player ever since about halfway through 2016, 2017. That's when his game like took a serious turn for the better. Do you remember that concussion he suffered two years ago? Really, really awful bad. hit. One of my Third least game in North America. One of my least favorite hits I've ever seen. It was against the Albany Devils in that series. Does anyone remember that? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, and uh, uh, he just come ten, over. Yeah, ten games. He, for he it. played about. He, I think he played a handful of games. He played like two or three, three games. Yeah, 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 and then suffered that brutal concussion. It was a long road back. He played a few months to ne- start that next season and didn't look like himself. Wasn't going to the dirty areas. Wasn't going hard to the net. Wasn't winning battles in the corner. Wasn't the same. You know, Andreas Janssen that you'd seen before. 
as the year went on, he started, I guess the concussion symptoms might have gone down a bit. Maybe he developed a bit more confidence. I don't know. I wasn't really there. But well, he supposedly couldn't even get on a plane to go home that And summer. that wouldn't shock me because, yeah. like, oh, that hit. I, I, I hate rewatching it, but sometimes I do it just to remind me of the you know, the heart, the, the battle back that he had that year. And then once he got, um, I guess, acclimatized to the AHL and then the symptoms uh, lessered, from about January onwards that year, he's a point per game player in the AHL. We saw this past season, point per game player in the AHL. This guy's been dominant at the AHL level. Comes up to the NHL level, and oof, I wrote an entire article about him just because I was obsessed with him because <laughs> he was eye test wise. You watch him, fast skater, could not quite like Kasperi Kapanen because the Leafs don't have a skater like Kasperi no. Kapanen. That guy is one of the twenty fastest guys in the league for my money. But janssen has got some wheels. After Kapanen. I, I think I'd wager that Janssen might be the next fastest guy in this Leafs team. He can fly. Wow. He is wow. so fast. He has some skill to get in the offensive zone. You see him on zone entries, creative with the puck. He's got a shot. He can beat goalies from a bit of distance, but he has a knack for getting his way to the crease, to the dirty areas. If you, Again, if we talk about scoring chances, high-danger scoring chances, he led the team in his time with the Maple Leafs in the regular season, more than JVR, more than Matthews. He was so good at getting to the dirty areas. And this was all while playing with, like, Dominic Moore. Yeah. You know? <laughs> this is like, yeah. He's, he wasn't, uh, wasn't putting up prime position. You mean Leafs' season. best fourth-line option last year, including after the trade, Dominic Moore? Well, Ooh, there you go. There I said um, it. A couple little bits of homework for the listeners. Um, it was Dan Kelly who hit Andreas Janssen. If you don't remember that hit, go back and look at it. It's on a YouTube channel called Hockey Webcast. And there's two Andreas Janssen videos that I'm sure you're going to go home and watch all night long uh, by Sear Video. Oh, yeah. Who's kind of an underrated Leafs YouTube channel. I watch channel. all his videos, man. Oh, the They're best. Great. Um, he's got MVP, all Andreas Janssen's 2017-18 Leafs and Marley's goals. And then he's also got one called Little Bones, which is uh, highlights from the first half of the season. Janssen... P- uh, pay particular attention to how he is in front of the net, man. He's a gritty player. And on the one-three-one power play, they put him in the middle there because they didn't really have anyone for that Matthews Nylander unit. They had Komarov there for a bit, and yeah. Like, oh, and once they switched man. him out, and then they put Janssen the, there. Like it's funny. Like literally, you could you could use anyone other than Komarov in the middle there it would probably help you. You put Janssen in there. The difference in that power play was night and day. They generated way more shots, way more dangerous chances. They had a slap pass option to J- Janssen in the middle. He could be like Kadri, slap pass it towards the net, mm-hmm. and then go to the net get into the open space for the rebounds he was really good at that i'm a big fan i love andres johnson and also great on the penalty kill carl grunstrom mm-hmm. carl grunstrom i still think needs another year in the ahl but i really like what i see from him he reminds me of zach hyman and I, I say that as a compliment i'm a big zach hyman fan what's he good at grunstrom's great at winning battles in the corner grunstrom is great on the penalty kill grunstrom is great at going to the net and finishing in tight a lot like Andreas Janssen will go to the dirty areas and will stay there. He reminds me of, do you watch Patrick Hornquist play a lot in mm-hmm. Pittsburgh? That's exactly who Grunstrom reminds me of. I think that's the upper echelon of, of what he could become, but he's uh, like a six foot tall power forward. You know, it, it's not like the Which, size is intimidating. That's a power forward these but days, he, man. I mean, Brendan Gallagher is a five foot nine power forward, yeah, you know, yeah. like he goes to the net yeah. and wins battles. That's what you need to do. And, I like Grunstrom. There's a chance he could win that fourth line left wing spot. It's it's up in the air. You know, Tyler Ennis might win it. Josh Levo probably won't because Mike Babcock hates him. You have um, <laughs> you have some other guys who could win it. You have some like Trevor Moore could squeak in and, and maybe steal that spot. Mason Marchment. Oh. Pay attention to these guys in preseason. This is this is a battle that might go down. We'll see what happens. There. Shout out Mike Stevens. Yeah, you, you, you just have to every time you bring up Trevor Moore. Yeah, you just have and, to. Do that. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so I, I just yeah because he seems like a guy that like Mike Babcock may particular mention of him last training camp and i thought oh okay you already likes him can i make a little bet and i was going to say it earlier you were like who the hell's going to score goals in the carolina hurricanes josh levo <laughs> no. he might be busy scoring goals in the edmonton oilers though so oh, maybe. hopefully maybe. oscar clefbaum is busy playing point with the loose who's, who's, who's Levo for clefbaum straight up who's gonna have uh, a BC. quicker selection in uh, the waiver wire i don't know yeah it's we'll true see. We'll see some guys. Some guys slip through the cracks, and it's weird. You never know, you, especially so. when you put it in that one day that everybody puts their players yeah. on, and nobody's got any room. That's when you sometimes squeak a goalie them through. squeaks through that shouldn't squeak through. Totally, it's just. Totally. I mean, we'll see what happens with Picard, but I think that if they, he might squeak through. You never know. Oh, we man. didn't talk about Sparks and McElhaney, but I guess that's another conversation. Nah. Well, uh, nah. Before the show, we discussed the I mean, goalies are voodoo. Well, one guy's 25, one guy's turning 35. I, I don't know why it's a hard discussion. It's not. But, it's mean, not. I, I got to give their fourth goalie. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, no, no. I mean, like, like McElhaney, Sparks, like, pfft. 
Yeah. I think you give it to Sparks, man. I, but he's got to prove it in camp. Prove it in camp. I, just, I saw an article today. I don't remember where it was, but it was basically Curtis McElhinney is coming off the best season of his career. Curtis McElhinney is probably going to lose his job. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, man, the life of a, of a pure backup, you know? It's a hard go. But there will be other teams that would be interested in a pure backup, even if he's a waiver wire pickup, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, just like the Leafs were. Now, um... Let's do the press conference because I know we've got some questions and, and, and quickly, Ian, uh, there's one thing I want to hit on before the sh- end of the show. So let's do the press conference. Uh, there's one question. It is from the Steve uh, Ferrari Cake. That's a reference to... <laughs> I wanted an Acura Cake. I, even though it's the opposite. It's one of our favorite references. <laughs> no, it's the, the best. So Ferrari Cake r- writes in, thoughts on the NHL banning keg stands with the Stanley Cup. What? They did? Uh, yeah, so, so... Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, basically, the NHL has asked the Washington Capitals to kindly stop doing keg stands with the Stanley Cup on account of... I don't know, and people... I see the look in your face, Adam. It's like, stop being such narcs, and why are you policing fun? Well, the reason they have asked the Capitals to stop doing this is because the Capitals are fucking up the Stanley Cup. <laughs> oh, is it? Is it? Is it breaking? <laughs> they dented uh, the actual cup part. Didn't somebody like crave in their name or something like that? Oh, or, or I wouldn't be shocked. Or something insane like that. I wouldn't be shocked at all. And the Stanley Cup has been banged up before. It's been dropped to the bottom of a lake. It's Michael Ryder. There's a video of Michael Ryder. Uh, I think he was with the Boston Bruins when he won it. He's got it in Newfoundland. He's holding it at about chest height, and it falls right onto the wooden deck he was standing on, and you just see this big, like, coffee cup-sized dent right in the cup. And I mean, they, there's, there's a reason they don't give these guys the real cup to celebrate with, because yeah. they don't trust them. <laughs> because yeah. you know that they're going to do crazy things when they celebrate with I it. I never got... Okay, so I did a Nike video years ago where I got to go to the Hockey Hall of Fame archives, and I was talking to Phil Pritchard, the guy with the white gloves who handles the cup, and... We were talking about how there's two cups. And I go, well, which one's the real one? And he goes, they're both the real one. Mm. What does that mean, Philip? Which one, is, which one was around the last time the Leafs won the cup is what I want to know. Yeah, which, yes, yeah. Which is the authentic Stanley Cup? There, no, there's not two cups. There's the They'll Stanley never tell Cup you. and one that looks an awful lot like it. They'll never tell you. So, so It's very confusing to me. Yeah, every time they keep removing the rings as well. So are all those rings actually the cup? Are there two versions of the ring that was removed? I don't know. Very confused, Wait, yeah. Phil. Anyway, also they want the caps. They to should build a third cup. cup. Uh, Pritchard's statement was: We asked them politely not to do it. Uh, we're trying to preserve the history of the Stanley Cup. We don't want any unnecessary damage to it or a person in case they drop the person or he presses too hard or something. Is okay. Philip Pritchard? What well, that makes Washington sense. I know there, there was one tweet. I'm not sure if it was today or yesterday about someone talking about how like no other team has like done this like with the Stanley Cup because like the, the seeing Ovechkin doing the crazy things with the cup and. It makes me think maybe they're the first team to show videos of keg stands, but you're telling me other other teams oh, haven't done keg done stands with the Stanley. Oh, what do you oh. think they were doing in the in the sixties, seventies, and eighties? What do you think was happening with that cup? Especially. I have an answer for that. Um, there was, I want to say, it was one of the last times the Leafs won the cup, or it was a really old Wings cup. But people would baptize their children in the Stanley <laughs> Cup, and what do kids do? They shit and piss at random, and. <laughs> People like kids have taken a dump in the Stanley Cup <laughs> because that's what kids do, and that's why they clean it every day, multiple times a day. Oh, because I would not want that job. Just remember, whenever you see your favorite player take a sip out of the Stanley Cup, someone took a dump in that thing, <laughs> or they eat a bowl of cereal out of the top of it. Yeah, mm, mm. Mm, that that polish taste in my milk is great. Mm, yeah, is that? I hope that's what the taste is. I, me too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> do you want your answer on the Stanley Cup? There's no brown Fruit Loops. Sorry. Anyway, do you want your answer on the Stanley Hell Cup? Hell yeah. <laughs> so there are technically three versions of the Stanley Cup. Okay. No, there are not. <laughs> there is one. There's the original. <laughs> the Stanley Cup. <laughs> The 1892 bowl. So that's that little part you see on top. Right. Yes. The 18, Which is the yes. cup. That's the, the bowl literal from, cup. Yeah. Right, yeah. From 1892. Yeah. There's the, the Dominion Hockey Challenge Cup and the 1963 Authenticated Presentation Cup and the 1993 Permanent Cup at the Hall of Fame. So oh. there's one that stays at the Hall of Fame the entire time. There's that cup that's 
that little cup on the top, mm. and then there's the fake one well, that goes one around. Which one has the cup on the top? I was going to say that's the, the authentic Dominion Hockey Challenge Cup in the original 1892 bowl is the cup, but then they had they built the rest of it. Sure, right? but my question is then. Is that the one they bring to the Stanley Cup Finals, and yeah, then they the, give you, the, and then they give you the beater cup that the you presentation that, cup? that you can beat up? <laughs> the Phil, presentation cup is that Phil, the, one the 1993 <laughs> permanent cup, the one in Hockey Hall of Fame? Is that a replica? Does that stay there, Phil? The Hockey Hall of Fame is on fire. You only have time and hands to remove one thing. <sighs> From there, from that burning building. Do you want me to read it to you? Which one is it? Building's fireproof, Steve. So the replicated <laughs> permanent cup. And it's made of wood. <laughs> was created in 1993 by a silversmith in Montreal. It It's used Boo, to stand it. in at the Hockey Hall of Fame whenever the presentation cup is not available for display. There are very few differences between the authenticated version and the Hockey Hall of Fame version. The surest way to identify one version from the other is to check the engraving for the 1984 Stanley Cup winning Edmonton Oilers. The authenticated version has X's engraved over um, Peter Poglington's name, whereas his name is completely missing from the Hall of Fame version. Right, they they took him off the cup and they they Didn't had someone like his kid on someone's sister. I think he put his sister on there or something he just like put that. Someone, yeah, random in the league was like, no, you may not. But they did carve it in. <laughs> there was a, there's been a few mistakes on the Stanley Cup. They spelled Adam Deadmarsh's name wrong. Yeah, and uh, Versteegs as well when he had his on with the uh, black. They actually had, they have it here. They had Eric Stahl. They gave him an extra A. Like there's three, three A's. A's. Yeah. Stahl. <laughs> That's how you say it in, in uh, Eastern Canada. Stahl. Uh, Manny Legacy was spelled with an A instead of an E. There's a whole bunch of errors here. The Leafs were spelled wrong in 1963. How That's do you funny. screw up the team <laughs> name? The Leafs? Because <laughs> they're they called like, the Laughs. They're correct. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're the Laughs. Right? Anyways. Yeah. Laughs. Stanley Cup the is fake. <laughs> Stanley Cup is fake news is what we learned today. <laughs> Everything I've ever loved is a lie. <laughs> it's not real. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> don't meet your heroes and don't meet your hero trophies. Someone like, okay, Ovechkin's going to win it again next year. And because he's eccentric and crazy, he's going to be like, I know lift this one. Is fake. <laughs> I look for X. There's no X. Hey, by the way, I, <laughs> I wonder if one. the brought the cup they brought to Russia with him. Mm. So Putin, I think Putin. So he, Putin can meet the cup. That's a Putin's house now. They definitely he kept it. They definitely didn't give him the the presentation, mm. like the authenticated uh, right. one. There's no also, way. Is the Hall of Fame one? Is the 1993 one not the real one now? Because that's the Hall of Fame cup. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, God damn! I hate I'm this. I'm angry. I'm like mind blown now. Yeah. I just also, don't know every other sport <laughs> remakes their trophy every year. So, like. but but that was the thing that was special about the Stanley <laughs> Cup. Is that we don't die. But you want to win the Stanley Cups. That's what it, the Washington Capitals are the reigning Stanley Cups champions. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all about the cups. Yeah. It's, it's all, all about, about the cups. Yes. Yeah, yeah, cups yeah. is Anyways. <laughs> That's okay. the end of the press conference. Okay, so, um, Ian, uh, one last thing is that you disappear for the summer, and you disappeared this year, and, and I, uh, I don't think a lot of people really know why, uh, but it's actually quite interesting, and it's something that's very personal to you. I kind of wanted to quickly kind of touch on that before we, before we went away. Yeah, no worries. That's funny. We were talking about it beforehand, and I decided to wear the shirt today. I, I tried to find my actually good Leafs shirt, and I couldn't find it. Which would have tied in well with what we were Is talking about Is it because you threw it out because you're mad that you didn't get royalties? No, I, I can't find it, and it's really bothering me. Did you have to pay me. for it? I actually did pay for no! it. No! Yeah, I supported. No! I supported my friend Jeff. Oh, actually, oh, shocking! I, oh my you god! Just, you supported his bad jersey buying stuff. I, I should get my own money back for that. Honestly, I'm very, very upset. <laughs> That's very funny. I, okay. I supported my good he friend Jeff. Did you buy you a shirt? Well, he, I didn't know. I, I wanted to. I'm like, oh, this is funny. I'm gonna wear this to like Marley's games and stuff. He I, owes you his one of a kind Jeremy Williams shirt. He does. Seriously. He does Jeff, if you're listening, kind. and I know you are. <laughs> Come on. For the first time in a while. Yeah, he, <laughs> he doesn't listen that much. Um, but uh, but anyway. Yeah, sorry. yeah uh, no, so I'm not wearing that shirt, unfortunately. I decided to wear my Camp Kennebec shirt, and that's um, the camp I've been working at for the last. This is my fourth summer. I've been there every summer now uh, for the last few years, and it's a camp for kids with special needs. And most of our kids are diagnosed with autism. Some of our kids have like ADHD, Down syndrome, any kind of the special needs that you have that you want to drop your kid off and you know help them have a enriching summer where they can be around 
some of the campers who understand what they're going through. For a lot of our campers, it's one of their opportunities to actually make a friend throughout the year, and it's just kind of heartbreaking, some of the stories that you hear. I've gone through uh, reading some of the profiles of our campers. You get to learn some of the, you know, the, the, the life situation. It's unfortunate, but getting to spend time with them throughout the day, getting to like teach them how to ride a bike, getting to go down the zip line with them, getting to be on the tube with them, just letting them have like a win for once in life or whether it's a week, whether it's two weeks, some of them stay for the whole eight weeks throughout the summer, but it's, I, I tried it out four years ago, my first summer and uh, I loved it. It was like the best thing I ever did. It made me realize that I want to work with kids and I've been going back every summer now. This is year number four and it's one of my favorite things I've ever done. I, I love doing it and I try to wear my camp shirts whenever I can whenever we hang out with the camp groups because I have different friends who go to the camp the camp's in the middle of nowhere it's in between like Kingston and Ottawa in this like random forest in the middle of nowhere it's like right off highway 7 again in Aqua it's called it's Arden Arden near, oh I know where that is near yeah. Tweed yep if anyone uh, knows where that my, is my, yeah. my, there you I go. spend summers up there yeah there you go yeah it's the middle of nowhere basically yep. yeah um, Arden named after Jan Arden yes mm, true yes yeah. and ah. Fre- Freedom Mobile does not have service there shockingly ah. <laughs> but uh, it's funny whenever I hang out with my friends like from that camp like let's say we're meeting up in Ottawa let's say we're meeting up in Kingston somewhere they'll all wear like you know the girls will wear like nice dresses the guys will wear their college shirts and I'll show up in my camp shirt being like yeah <laughs> represent <laughs> Camp Kennebec but uh one of my favorite things I've ever done and I hope that my schedule permits me to, to do it next summer but if if not I'll just show up for like a week or so to say hi but I, it's my my heart is there I love are, it so are much. you I was surprised actually today and this is going to put you in an awkward spot, but I don't really care. Uh, uh, I care about you, but uh, I don't, this puts James in an awkward spot. I was surprised that you are not one of the names on the athletic. Are you athletic full time now? No, I'm not. I'm a contributor to the athletic officially as of right now. So that's my uh, okay. That's my role. I I don't know what to say. Like James, I, I write articles for the <laughs> James. If you're listening, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Come on, man. What's one more person, James? <laughs> What's one more? <laughs> one more. One more, James. You're going to stop at 149 Pokemon there, James? As, as I told you, <laughs> Ian, uh, uh, I knew it would if put you in an awkward spot. It was really just yes. our way of saying, can you please freaking hire this guy full time? Because yeah, you have done, uh, and I got to tell you this, this isn't just blowing, blowing smoke because you're here. Um, you have done some absolutely incredible work, and all of the... The, the 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 people that follow you are rabid about you. Uh, the people that read you, like myself, genuinely enjoy your work because you make it easy to consume. Mm-hmm. You take complex ideas, you take complex numbers, and you make them consumable for guys like us. And that enhances our enjoyment of the game and our an- analysts here, honestly. Uh, and I, I just, I, I have to say, man, you're, you're doing an amazing job. Whatever it is you're doing, keep doing it because they're crazy if they don't bring you on full time. Someone else will. I, uh, I kind of, I feel like I said maybe a couple years ago or something that I felt like the hockey blogosphere was sort of getting stagnant. That's not the case anymore. There's so many people that I really love reading and I'm going to, I'm going to say there was like an under 30 group or something like that. And in my new, yeah, cause we're now over 30. Yeah, yeah. Than Steve. <laughs> hates me. I, 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 dude, I hate it. I hate it so much. But, uh, in the new under 30 group, we'll say under 28. Maybe, <laughs> uh, you're a, you're a top five guy for me. I really appreciate five, that. Five, I don't know what to say. That's like one of the nicest things someone said to me. Thank you. Well, you guys are really you appreciate deserve it. Well, here, I'll top like, it. Uh, people, <laughs> <laughs> here's the top five nice things Steve no, said. Well, and, and like you're, you're a great writer. You're fun to read and all that. And, and still like fans of you don't even know the half of it because, you know, you do that camp thing in the summer. And, you know, my family benefited from the Easter Seals camps when I was a kid. And people like you make the world go around, man. And I hope you know that. You used a really key word. Uh, in there when you were describing your camp and that's enriching you're not there to kill hours in a day you know you're not there as a, as a daycare for parents Baby you're there, center, yeah, no. yeah you're there to provide a an experience for these kids and I guarantee you it's something they're never f- gonna forget mm-hmm. absolutely so. as you said give them a win they deserve that um, so uh, one, so yeah. congratulations on all the great work you do on the person that you are but also uh, are give, we all gonna cry give is your I'm, 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 I'm like close. touchy and feeling yeah. now. <laughs> I mean Jesse's not gonna cry can we hug it out <laughs> <laughs> is Jesse gonna watch us cry is that, is that what's about to happen Jesse will not cry it's like the end of Forrest Gump right now no, but I, I do want to say give your podcast which is also excellent a, a huge shout out here yeah, well, how I mean, can people find you no I don't know <laughs> I don't think so I don't know 
I wonder if he would come on here and be like, you guys, you said top five young bloggers for, or writers for me. He would be like, top five old guy podcasts for him. <laughs> oh. Oh, you're my favorite to over 30 podcast. Oh. Wow. Yeah, actually, no, we still have Jesse. We still have Jesse. <laughs> and also, what would you say to James and Jonas, man? They're they're over thirty. They are over thirty. Are they over forty now? They don't, they don't like how old they are. I know. No, nobody not, likes no, how no, old they are. No. <laughs> Take it easy on them. James and Jonah or Jonah. That's, that's what my, is, my favorite name? over fifty podcast. I, oh it's my favorite <laughs> not hiring Ian fast enough podcast. Oh. Like thirty yeah. four. Yeah, yeah. I think Myrtle's in this, isn't Myrtle in his mid thirties. I, could be uh, I, I you know what the I time was like Adam th- on, I don't know. Thirty five was the number that was coming James, to me, but I'm not sure. James is a bit like you know. There's certain people that you're like, I can ballpark what age range you're at. But if James, like, if you never saw a picture of James with his kids, you could be anywhere from 27 to like 42 with and that guy. Just you just don't know. know. And the fact that he's like six foot 12 makes it tougher to totally. Like, and just and like, like real thin, right? Like yeah. as you get older, like me, you put on some pounds, right? Yeah. James hasn't done that. No, so and no. I, I, I'm a little mad about it. This podcast got weird. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I uh, I think I think we're done here. Well, no, well, I, let's let's hear the, get, let's get hear the, the shout episode. out. No I'm kidding. Get to the shout oh, yeah, out. Yeah. Shout out. Yeah, yeah. that we need. Oh right, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I do. I've been doing a podcast the last couple of years. And oh, what's when Steve sorry, making, no, no, a, making ahead, a face? I'm worried. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> and uh, when yeah, I realize something, I can't help but react physically. No, it's sorry. all good. Um, so I've been doing a podcast the last couple of years it's called the Leafs Geeks Podcast, and it's funny. I actually reached out to Steve and Adam when I first started it. This is like. Two and a half years ago, and I went and I dug up like the old Facebook it's only messages. Been two and a half years. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> I think that's what it was. It was January of the tank season. Okay, to wow. give you an idea. Oh, all right, yeah. all right, all right. And uh, back when like uh, Brad Boys was on the team and company. Oh, good good shit. times. Mark Arcabello. <laughs> wow! Don't talk ill of Mark Arcabello. I love Mark Arcabello. I love yeah, me some Mark Arcabello. <laughs> And uh, I reached out to you guys, and I was just like, do you guys have any tips for me? Because I have no idea what I'm doing here. I've been listening to you guys for a couple of years at that point, and I'm just like, I love what you do. And I was expecting you guys to honestly just not respond, because I'm like, eh, I'll just you know throw shit at the fan, see if something sticks, why not? And you both got back to me with like really long, like well-thought-out responses, and it like, really helped me at first when I was starting out. I still feel like it took me a while to like finally... like find my groove and find what I was like looking for and what I wanted to do. But I feel like the last year or so I've finally like found a niche of, of what I'm good at. I'm, there's no way rhythm be, to it. Yeah. I won't, I'm never going to be as entertaining as you guys. You guys are hilarious and fun and you also do a good job analyzing things. You're a great balance. I'm never going to have that balance because I'm not that funny and I'm not that entertaining, but I find that, uh, I, I'm really good with the numbers, but I try my best to simplify it in a way that makes sense. And I feel mm-hmm. like I'm getting better at that. And it's funny you say that, Ian, because we're not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, <you're laughs> so we played our strength. Well, Steve, we played a Steve's strength. Steve's the funny one. Uh, but uh, but yeah, Steve's the angry one. But yeah, yeah. To give like <laughs> how, how can we, if no one if someone listening to this has never heard your show, how do they find it? So whatever you listen to this podcast on, whatever you listen to the Steve Dangle podcast on, you can probably find my podcast there. Uh, Sound. Cloud, iTunes, Stitcher. I'm going to start putting stuff out on YouTube now. I think Good. now that I've got the Steve Dangle bump, I need to uh, officially <laughs> start off uh, my YouTube and, and make that because that's, I know you guys get a lot of views on your, on your videos for those. Like if so. you got nothing else, set up a phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, um, Leafs Geeks podcast. I do an episode at least once a week. I try to do, and we, I try to break down the finer points of the game without getting too complex. I try to explain it in a way that makes sense to hockey fans. So I'm never going to break down someone's, you know, Corsi four percentage relative to teammate, their their war, RPM. It's like, it's like, like a conversation between Stephen Birch and Tyler Dell. Yeah, like I'm not. I, I try my best <laughs> at to, three in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> on a Tuesday. I try my best to not just have those awkward, like, difficult to understand sure, conversations. Sure. I try to take the difficult, like you said, make it as simple as possible and put it out in podcast form. I feel like a lot of the times it's easier to write an article when it comes to that type of stuff because you can supplement it with a graph or with a video or. With a gif. If it's more than three tweets, yeah. it should be an article. Oh, you've te- you told that to me before. <laughs> <laughs> Steve is. Were you, I still remember. Because I go on okay, Twitter you rants. Like, Steve, follow me. Steve, follow me. Steve, follow me. And, and I was like, honestly, I don't I would think love I ever to- said that to you. Uh, I no. seem to remember. And, and I don't. I don't beg people for follows. No, it wasn't. It wasn't one of those. But it was like, uh, oh well, you know, it, it was. I saw you talking to other people. I think, and you're like, oh, maybe he will one day. And I think what I said was, honestly, I want to. 
but you tweet a shitload. <laughs> <laughs> you tweet a lot. And there were and after I followed you, there were a couple times where I felt like going, Ian. <laughs> hey. But no, you tweet like a person now. I've been, and I really like you. To be honest, <laughs> it's because of Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I ruined it. I ruined his whole thing. Anytime I go more than two or three, I'm like, oh, oh, Steve's gonna yell at me. Yeah. Like, no, <laughs> well, you're doing yourself a disservice. Like this, you make a living doing this shit now. And stop I, cutting your own and, feet off. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys know Adam uh, Lascaris or Lascaris. I can't pronounce <laughs> yeah, his last name. He's told me the same thing. Anytime I have more than like two or three tweets, it's like, Ian, dude, write an article on this. I'm like, yeah. Crap, yeah. you're right. So and that is a managing editor at uh, theleafsnation.com, is he mm. not? Yeah, I think that's his role now. Yeah, that's he's the new Jeff. Lord. Also, that's a thing that I passed down. <laughs> also, the first guy uh, who right. confidently told me, confidently told me, and he had information. Don't ask me how, and don't ask me what the information was. Confidently told me Tavares to the Leafs. He and, also, he, and it was like it was a, a bit. There was a good chunk of time beforehand, and he's like, he's coming. It's it, happening. Was it before, or after Anthony? Uh, was it Petrielli? Petrielli? Tweeted it out. Yeah. Oh no! It was like it was like before free agency. Oh wow! Yeah, he there was like, go. he's coming because of this, and I can't say what this was. Nah. I'm giving it to him. I'm giving it to him. Uh, The thing that I reacted to was the AHL thing that we didn't get to, but it's way too late to get to. So I'll maybe make a video on it. Okay. How's that? Sounds good. Ian, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me on, guys. Really appreciate it. Jesse's done with the show. You can tell he's back from the microphone. Jesse's been done for like 15 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back uh, next week. Who, Who do we have on? Uh, I believe uh, Jeremy from How To Hockey is coming on. We still need to finalize that. Amazing. So hopefully Jeremy from How To Hockey, if not someone else. And the closer we get... We, I think we, at that we point, canceled on Mark Savard. <laughs> we still can't oh yeah, we should we probably oh, yeah, okay. And Chris Johnson's coming back sometime this month. Uh, in about three weeks, we are back to two episodes a week, so get ready for that. Mm, Thank and you. A, and Ken Reed as well. And him too. All right. And See there you. is real hockey this weekend. Yeah. Rookie camp. There's it's not going to be televised. Tournament. Yeah. Damn it's it. not televised? Apparently, the Montreal thing, they won't televise it. They're not Are televised. you kidding me? The first televised preseason game is next Saturday when they go to China and Calgary plays LA at 2.30 in the morning. I Thank you, don't. noted Tim and Sid producer, Jesse Blake. And the Leafs' first game is Tuesday the 18th. Hell yeah. Yep. I'm making time. Love you guys. Thanks for listening. Bye. Follow the guys on Twitter at Steve underscore Dangle at Adam W-Y-L-D-E and at Jesse Blake. The Steve Dangle Podcast. Brought to you by Panago Pizza. Order at panago.com and stuff your face with deliciousness.